process started. Um, thank you so much for all the speakers and listeners from us today. This is the chapter one of financial fitness event, and we will be talking about uh, e-commerce and marketplaces this to come. And the format moving forward um, will be about ten speakers uh, per session. And one thing, uh, really quick, that if all of the speakers can mute themselves. So, during the conversation, they will be good. So um, j just to respect uh, the presenter. And uh, moving forward, we're going to have about 10 speakers every two weeks. Uh, and each speaker will have um, approximately 10 minutes uh, to present their topic. And uh, so thank you so much for all the speakers to be a part of this event. I'm really excited. And um, let's go ahead and kick this event. Yeah, and then really quickly, thanks again, thanks to everybody for coming. Um, I'm helping Max organize this. I mean, he's really the one behind all of this. But uh, if you have any topics that you're interested in hearing about in the future weeks, months, whatever it may be, we're, we're going to try to make this 10-minute rounds per person and just make it really smooth and fun. And just, you know, if there's any topics you're curious about learning, just message Max and we'll try to get it done for you in the future. But uh, as Max said, let's get it started. I think our first speaker is Daniel, if I'm not mistaken. So if you want to start talking, go for it. Yeah, absolutely. So I am Dan Klein. I am a lead advisor at Seven Investing, uh, and I host a show called Seven Investing Now. I also follow the retail space. Now, people don't really love talking about or investing in retail because there's this idea that it's this sort of spent space, that uh, that brick and mortar is dead and dying. And that sort of makes sense when you look at the growth of the internet. But the reality is the internet isn't as big as you think it is when it comes to shopping. So when people look at retail, and I've done this as a poll countless times, you know, what percentage of, of sales are online? And people will uniformly, by like a 70, 80% margin, say it's over 50%. Here is the reality. During the peak of the pandemic, the time when we were all locked up in our houses, I mean, we weren't really locked up in our houses, but it felt like that, the online sales peaked at 20%. In 2019, they were just under 4%, 14%. Why is that? It's because people like going to stores. So we have this narrative that retail is dying. Here is the reality. Bad retail is dying. It's not Amazon that killed Sears. It's Sears that killed Sears. You don't want to go to Sears because the merchandise is terrible because they've done a bad job in evolving. So then, then the next one you hear is, oh, God, malls are dying. All the malls are going to close. And here's the reality. The bad malls are suffering. That weird mall like three towns over that has like a local restaurant in the food court where 90% of the stores sell cell phone cases or hats. Yeah, that mall is in trouble. A-list malls, top tier malls, actually saw foot traffic peak in 2019. I know, I know it's hard to think back all the way to 2019. So I'll get a little closer. During the two weeks before Christmas in 2020, the good malls, the A-tier malls, saw 95% of that peak traffic. So even during a pandemic, people went, I need a Christmas gift. I better go out. So what a mall actually is, is going to change. That is true. You're going to see more events, uh, more, more performances. You might see co-works. You might see grocery. You might see gyms. But malls will survive, malls will be strong. So what trends are we seeing in retail? This is something that sort of tells us as an investor kind of who's winning. Well, big name brands like Nike and Under Armour, they're leaning into going direct to consumer. Now that doesn't mean you're not gonna see Nike uh, you know, in a finish line or in a foot locker, but you're not gonna see Nike in a Coles. Nike isn't gonna partner with any wholesaler that doesn't focus on Nike as a premium brand. And then you're seeing top tier online brands have discovered they need a brick and mortar presence. Uh, Warby Parker and Nordstrom, uh, Target and Ulta. Ulta has a big brick and mortar uh, footprint, but they're, instead of expanding that, they're going to go into hundreds of targets. You're going to see Casper Mattress uh, show up in department stores. You're going to see Untuck It. All of these brands that you previously thought of as digital only, or at least mostly digital, realize they need a physical presence. So why does Nike want to go direct to consumer? Because they want to control that relationship. They want to know what you buy, when you buy it, and sort of market to you directly. So what does that mean? Well, it means that brand matters more than it ever has. People are going to seek out Nike. If I'm Nike, I'm not all of a sudden going to buy Skechers. Like if I, if I wanted Nike, that's what I'm going to get. Uh, but 
Target because I trust Target. And the fact that it's on the shelf, if it's a Target owned and operated brand, um, I'm going to trust that. So that's the company more than any other retailer that sort of hedged with having these tons, dozens of owned and operated brands. Some are partnerships, like their deal with uh, Chip and Joanna Gaines for Magnolia products. But basically, the credibility is target when you're buying, say, a Good & Gather product on the on their food shelves or or one of their uh, their cleaning brands. Like, you don't know what that brand is. It doesn't mean anything to you. You're seeing this with Dick's Sporting Goods as well. Dick's has sort of seen the writing on the wall, and they've taken space away from Under Armour, and they're prepared for what happens if Nike no longer wants to do business with them. We don't really know that that's going to happen, but it could happen. So retail is becoming a game of winners and losers. There are some very clear losers. I mentioned Sears before, JCPenney, uh, the non-distinct stores at the mall. Like, are you really going to Banana Republic? You probably aren't. Uh, you know, we've seen massive struggles with The Gap. On the other hand, they own Old Navy, which is fast fashion and cheap and appeals to parents. Uh, so it becomes very tricky. But the big winners are the winters. Consumers are driving some of these changes. There are some winners. Um, people still like going to TJX, uh, to the TJX stores, Marshalls, uh, Home Goods, uh, TJ Maxx. They still like going to Ollie's and Five Below, even Dollar General, which uh, is a store that serves local people who were within a mile of its store. They have specific audiences. Those audience audiences are physically going to those stores. So what is happening in retail isn't the narrative you're getting. It takes more to get you to leave your house. So I'm not necessarily leaving my house to pick up a few groceries. Foods might have, you know, a better selection of, you know, cuts of fish or things I want to look at. That might be enough to get me to go out. If I know that Target has a, a really good liquor store, which uh, near one of our houses, uh, which that sounds way richer than it is, um, near one of our houses, the Target there has a beautiful liquor store with local beers and all sorts of interesting products. Well, that might get me to go to Target rather than just stopping at CVS, which might be more convenient to get to from a parking point of view. So it's a real case of when. When you look at retail, to dismiss brick and mortar is a mistake. But what are the good retailers doing well in brick and mortar? Well, if you look at Walmart and Target, everything is omni-channel. So when you order from Walmart, you're being served from a store, not necessarily from a distribution center. So all these companies with these huge footprints, they're devoted to back-end functionality, and we don't know what the customer of the future is going to look like. You know, we are seeing people, like if you're buying a 65-inch television, you might walk into a Target, look at it, order it on your phone for delivery, because who has a car that can fit a 65-inch television? You might see the opposite. You might find something you want right now. You pick out the printer you want, uh, and you put it into your computer, and you go to a Best Buy, and you pick it up because you need a printer right now. Most of the winners in retail, and again, there are the exceptions of the treasure hunt stores, but most of the winners in retail are basing their business on, we can be anything for customers at all times. Meaning, if I, I live about four tenths of a mile from a Target, if I want to walk over to Target and get a coffee at the moment, I can't drink that coffee in the store, but if I wanted to do that normally, I could walk around with my coffee, browse the shelves, pick up a few things and go home. If I know what I want and I don't have the time to do that, I can place a curbside pickup order. I could use Shipped to have that delivered to my house. So basically, retail is becoming anything you want. And is Amazon going to be a big winner? Absolutely. But they're not going to be the only winner. You're going to see Amazon as a winner. You're going to see Walmart as a winner. You're going to see Target as a winner. Best Buy has clearly won. Uh, Dick Sporting Goods, I think, has a real chance. Over on the digital side, you're going to see Shopify enable every retailer that basically isn't the scale of Amazon or Target uh, be able to have many of those services. So I know this is a space people don't get excited about. There's, there's not a lot of... Uh, uh, you know, companies that are going to be a 10 bagger in three years in retail. But if you look at the good retail players, they tend to be a it tend to be a slow climb up the mountain. If you pull out the chart, companies I just said positive things about. There's the occasional dip. Target had its credit card scandal. Walmart's had some ups and downs. But for the most part, years. years. I spoke very quickly to keep this under 10 minutes. I am of course 
Always happy to take questions uh, at Worst Ideas 7 on Twitter. And for any of you listening today, uh, we have a special offer. If you go to 7investing.com slash subscribe and use the term retail, we will give you a free month. So that is my plug there. I think I came in under 10 minutes. You did great. That was fast. I think you came in at eight and a half. So appreciate your time. <laughs> <laughs> that might be a per- that might be a personal record for uh, <laughs> for uh, brevity. Um, yeah, thanks, Max. Anything you want to say or? Okay, thank you so much, Daniel. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Next up, we have Brad. Brad. Yeah, I I do not think I'm going to be able to keep it under ten minutes. So just uh, go ahead and, and stop me when I'm when just I'm over. T- yeah. But my company... I mean, just talk and we'll go. Yeah, go ahead. Cool. Uh, so my company is called Olo. It's a new IPO and they call themselves the holistic off-premise solution for restaurant chains. So this is a really good follow-up to Dan's talk is this is kind of the company supporting brick and mortar restaurant chains and not really trying to compete with them. And they're helping them to do so by building out other revenue chains like drive through curbside, carry out and delivery. And doing so also while using a purely private label approach to support the chains every step of the way. So kind of going into the restaurant challenges and why Olo is finding success. A combination of perishable goods, fluid menus, inconsistent tech integration across locations, in-person dining accommodation, reliance on multiple third parties, all of these quickly moving pieces makes developing uniform in-house off-premise solutions daunting, but still very important in the environment we find ourselves in. And according to Cohen, um, the effect of this plethora of issues is that 10% of 2019 restaurant sales occurred via digital channels, versus 50% for uh, for an asset like books. So the pandemic definitely boosted this usage rate, but there remains a very long runway to grow. Um, Olo calls its TAM today $7 billion. That can grow to $20 billion via new products and smaller restaurants. Um, 60% of restaurants' revenues were via off-premise in 2020, and as of 2025, that's supposed to be upwards of 80%. Um, and restaurant share from 1955 to 2019 grew from 25 to 51%. So all these tailwinds, are kind of coinciding with restaurants taking a bigger piece of the food revenue pie and off premise beginning to take a larger piece of the pie. And that's where and that's where Olo's really interesting opportunity comes in. So delivery as a percentage of industry sales rose from kind of six and a half percent to 10% in 2020. And the pace is probably going to re-slow with opening, reopening, but the the overall trajectory of that rise probably will continue. And the nine percent compound annual growth rate that that restaurants are enjoying from 2020 to 2025. Again, according to Cohen, off-premise is by far the largest contributor to that growth. So that's Olo's niche, and and that's where Olo helps. So kind of going into its product offering, um, its first product is ordering. So it's a private label, everything's private label, solution for um, order and pay via mobile, web, voice, whatever you want to do it through. Um, You can build your own branded ordering platform. It's compatible with most back-end systems. You get easy real-time menu tweaking and storage an integration of ordering with food prep kitchens um, so so you can kind of ease up your reliance on dining space if you're struggling with rent. Their second product is called Dispatch. Um, this is a, a little more interesting to me. So the first product is kind of a Shopify copycat, and then the, the rest of the product offering really rounds up the, up the value prop, in my opinion. So Dispatch is their delivery offering and management solution. So it selects from up to eight DSPs, delivery service providers, based on pri- based on pricing and timing and coordinates um, delivery arrival and timing. With dispatch, chains can perform 0% to 100% of the deliveries in-house. It's entirely up to them. And we have to keep in mind that Olo is not actually doing any delivering themselves. Um, That is not part of their business model. That will not be part of their business model. And that is why I like the company and why the margins are so good. But a lot more on that later. So Olo's third product is called Rails. This product is three years old. The The company's products are all less than a decade old. Um, so this aggregates demand across marketplaces and non-marketplaces to, to manage various channels um, to integrate orders through the, the restaurant chain's POS system. So essentially, the, the story behind this, according to the CEO, Noah Glass, is he found that when people were searching for, I want to buy Jimmy John's or I want to buy Sweet Green tonight, and they would put that into the Google menu, the first several links, the first se- several options would be, um, Uber Eats or DoorDash or Postmates. And, and those marketplace sales for the restaurant chains are far lower margin than, than, the, than the profit margin they'd realize going directly th- to, with the consumer. Kind of, again, go, uh, piggybacking on Dan's comment on direct-to-consumer being a much more attractive sale. So the chains have been shipping away their profit margin when still 
the people are searching for their brand. They're not searching for DoorDash. They're not searching for Uber. And in my opinion, because of this, they should be realizing the higher margins. So that's really what Rails does through a partnership with Google and through a partnership with other non-marketplace channels. It allows Olo to place its clients menu items directly onto the search page so that you can go directly through the through the restaurant rather than shipping off some of your profit margin to a marketplace. Now, their last product is called Serve. This is kind of an extension of its ordering platform. It's an updated front end. So essentially, this is their extension into on premise. So off-premise was definitely boosted by the pandemic and on-premise will come back and Olo wants a piece of that growth. Um, just as an FYI, 71% of consumers use three Olo modules versus 44% year over year. And again, all these products are designed to bring legacy chains into the 21st century by making off-premise as second nature as it is for its modern competition to put chains in control of their data by giving them access to it and action actionable recommendations from it and to place brands at the center of all digital activity, not, not a marketplace. Um, and it also is, is really, really convenient for these chains with hundreds of national chains for integrating ac across loca locations. And according to Noah Glass, more modules are coming. So Olo's reach um, is pretty impressive. So they serve over 50% of the largest public chains, over 50% of the fastest growing private chains. So think some of their clients are Chili's, Applebee's, Shake Shack, Wingstop, Sweet Green, Jimmy John's, the list goes on and on and on. They have 400 customers in 64,000 locations. QSR Magazine and AP News calls them the leading ordering platform for restaurant chains, and they boast a 99% client renew renewal rate since 2015, and they are not cherry picking their enterprise clients represent 91% of their locations, so that is very telling. And why is this, why is this renewal and retention so strong? I think it is because of the private label approach. So but Olo users can forego the cost of building and maintaining a digital presence. They can develop deeper consumer relationships by getting a bird's eye view look of all of their consumer data so that they can act on it. Marketplaces are keeping a lot of this data for themselves, not all of it, but a lot of it. Um, and they can boost their overall sales and margin without, without sacrificing profit or brand integrity. And why private label is so important to me, um, according to a lot of surveys that I looked through, and I'll just highlight one, according to National Restaurant Association, 64% of people want to order with a brand, not a marketplace. 70% of Olo clients use it to manage their own data and margin. And, and, and I know I'm sounding a little bit redundant there, but it's, it's really, really important to highlight. The restaurants are the most important brand in this value chain of ordering food. And Olo is enabling them to keep their brand, keep their data, and keep their profit margin. So they're allowing them to compete with all these all, all of these really intimidating new entrants um, while, while still maintaining control of their business. And I think that may, helps explain a lot of the 120% revenue retention they've sported over the last four years. So Olo's impact, um, and I'm, I'm checking the time, but I, got a, I have a little more time, so I'm going to start speaking more quickly. Um, it's 20, in 2020, it's clients. You have three minutes, we're good. Cool. It's, it's clients saw 156% bump in same store digital sales. That was boosted by the pandemic, but when looking at the year before, they got a 44% bump in same store sales. Um, so, so it really, it did get a boost from the pandemic, but it seems like they were really trending in the right direction beforehand. Um, how they make money, Rails and Dispatch is transaction based, so uh, they pay. So partners pay for usage, um, and then ordering is a subscription model. So revenue mix in 2020 was 56.7% subscription, and then the rest was transaction. And as I kind of highlighted. They're working with over 50% of the fastest private chains in, in, the, in the United States. So as these chains grow, their volume-based, transaction-based approach to, to revenue generation will, will grow naturally. Um, kind of moving on to financial performance. Um, this year, revenues grew 94% to $98 million. 81% gross profit margin expanded 10% year-over-year. 16% operating margin inflected positive year-over-year. Um, cash flow inflected positive, net income inflected positive, and again, that 120% revenue retention. So the thing to highlight here is they're really not spending very much money to realize the hyper growth that they're, that they're depicting and showcasing for investors. And their gross, their GMV has, has gone from 100 million in 2014 to 14.6 billion this year. So they're really in hyper growth mode. And the most important thing about that is their margins are also quickly moving in the right direction. They are not burning through cash. They have no outstanding debt. And they now have several hundred million dollars in cash on the balance sheet. So turning to um, future growth opportunities, and I'm running out of time, but uh, actually, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to the DoorDash stuff and, and just finish with that because I think that's important to highlight. 
So they do, Olo does get 20% of its revenues from DoorDash. And I'm not going to use this um, as a platform to, to hate on DoorDash because I think it's a great company. Um, the ongoing legal battle, there's an ongoing legal battle between the two companies for $7 million in total fees that Olo supposedly overcharged DoorDash, which they vehemently um, disagree with and say is baseless, as, as you'd kind of hope and as you'd expect. I'm not super concerned about Olo being out, cut out of the equation. I, I am more so concerned, though, that this young growth company is going to have to spend time and attention on these legal battles with, with a deeper pocketed DoorDash. On the other hand, DoorDash is also trying to emula emulate Olo's offering, which I find kind of encouraging. Um, just, or I guess mimicry is the best form of flattery. But I'm, I'm sure they will have some success with the private label websites they're building and the private label delivery service that they're offering. But in my opinion, Olo's most valuable product is the ordering function that um, allows chains to automatically make, make delivery services compete based on price and timing. And with DoorDash, with that private label service, they are not offering you that. You have to do it manually. So these, to me, are still very much so complementary products, al although they are kind of mer merging a little more so than they have been in the past. And it's also good to keep in mind that DoorDash private label sp specifically lists Olo as a partner. And clients like Chili's and Sweetgreen are both listed by Olo and by DoorDash. So it really seems like they're hopefully going to put these legal battles in, in the rear view and continue making nice and, and making a lot of money together. Um, I think I'm over my time, so I'm going to stop. I have so much more to say, but uh, yeah, 10 minutes. Nice job, man. Thank you. That was interesting. No, I thank you. Um, I, I think next up, I mean, uh, we have Clueless, actually, who is going to talk about DoorDash. So it kind of segues perfectly, and he might be – one of the I haven't seen many DoorDash bowls, so I'm kind of interested in hearing about DoorDash here. So, without further ado, clueless. Yep. Thanks, Mark. Uh, today I'll be talking about uh, DoorDash. Uh, DoorDash's mission statement is to grow and empower local economies. They do this in two ways: one, by helping the brick and mortar companies compete against the giants like Amazon or Domino's Pizza, and two, by offering a steady stream of income to Dashers. DoorDash was co-founded by Tony Hsu in 2013 and is currently the CEO of the company. In 2013, while Tony was still at Stanford Business School with the local macaroon store in Palo Alto, the store owner, Chloe, showed them a book of orders that had a bunch of customer information, but she had That's when Tony and his co-founders realized the large untapped potential of delivery ahead of them. DoorDash business model, in a nutshell, is a three-sided marketplace comprising of consumers, merchants, and dashes. They essentially aggregate the consumer demand through their mobile phone, where merchants list their food menus, products, and any customer orders are fulfilled by delivery partners, also known as dashes. They currently deliver food for restaurants, groceries, prescriptions, alcohol, and many more. DoorDash now has over 20 million consumers, over 400,000 merchants, and over a million dashes. They currently operate in U.S., Canada, and Australia. One interesting dash is that they were on the verge of bankruptcy in 2016. Somehow managed to raise a down round and then went to increase the market share virtually from nothing to over 50. eighty percent market share as they aggregated merchant menus and connected them to consumers. The delivery was fulfilled by merchants themselves, not by the grub hub. The restaurants listed on Grubhub skewed to urban areas as the popularly held belief at the time was that suburbs don't have the same population or no density as cities. Hence, the unit economics won't work. Counter to this com common knowledge, DoorDash noticed that delivering food in suburbs was actually more profitable and the order sizes were larger as demographics skewed towards families in suburbs versus single folks in the cities. They also noticed that in the cities, the drivers expected more pay and consumers expected lower prices. Also, due to lighter traffic and easier parking, Dashers could pick up more orders per hour, dramatically increasing efficiency and their earnings potential. After this insight to target suburbs, DoorDash went about solving the chicken and egg problem, that is increasing the supply of restaurants. I say it's a chicken and egg problem because the restaurants won't sign up without seeing the value and the consumers won't sign up without seeing a large selection of products. So they did a growth hack. Without an official partnership, they listed thousands of restaurants on their website and mobile app, uploaded the menus on their app, which helped them solve the supply problem. Once the restaurants saw the demand from consumers, they saw value from DoorDash and not surprisingly signed a partnership. 
Then they went on to sign large restaurant chain partners, Chipotle's Wendy's, which gave them a huge scale in the suburbs. After this, they did a large national marketing campaign, acquiring a large customers across the country. Then they finally introduced the Dash Pass, their subscription product, which helped lock the high frequency spenders. So Grubhub, towards the end of this, market share fell from 80% to a measly 11%. Grubhub accepted defeat when they were finally acquired by Takeaway last year. DoorDash's network effects are immense. By reaching more customers, merchants would be able to do more sales and would incentivize even more merchants onto the platform, leading to increased selection and better consumer engagement. For Dashers, these increased orders would lead to higher efficiency and earnings potential, resulting in faster deliveries for the customers. The most interesting part of DoorDash's business is that this flywheel needs to be replicated per city, which is extremely hard, and that's their biggest moat. To give you an example of the strength of this network effects and the scale at which DoorDash operates, DoorDash started grocery delivery in 2020 and increased the market share from less than 5% to over 50% in little over a year. This, despite having formidable competitors in Instacart, Uber, Amazon Fresh, who had a much bigger lead over them. That level of execution is mind-blowing. Now let's talk about the business optionalities. For a long time, critics of Amazon always questioned the profitability, but failed to see the flywheel effects of Amazon as they layered on more profitable businesses on top of their e-commerce business. DoorDash is doing something very similar. First, let's start with DashPass. DashPass is a subscription service offered by DoorDash for $9.99 per month, offering customers unlimited free delivery, similar to the one by Amazon Prime. DoorDash noticed that DashPass customers tend to order three times more than regular customers. DoorDash makes up most of the lost delivery free revenue and makes it up in order volume. DashPass is a no-brainer for customers who regularly order food from DoorDash. Similar to Costco's business model, I think DashPass will generate significant profits from DoorDash in the long term. The next, white label service. Using DoorDash API, brick and mortar companies like Best Buy, can integrate delivery into their order workflow and the last mile, last mile fulfillment can be done by DoorDash. You think a one-day one day delivery from Amazon is impressive? DoorDash can now do it in 45 minutes or less. Uh, uh, next up, advertising. DoorDash has a huge potential in its nascent advertising business. Like Amazon or Google, when a user types in a search, there is the intent of purchase behind it. No one goes to DoorDash to window shop. They're out to buy something. These intent-based ad searches command a higher premium. DoorDash can sell this ad space on their app to merchants to help them acquire customers. Next, Ghost Kitchens. Ghost Kitchens is an interesting concept that will turbocharge food delivery scene. Traditional restaurants are not optimized for food, pure food delivery. They don't have the dedicated pickup lines, have extra front of house staff, and need more floor space to seat the customers, which all usually means it requires more capital and more fixed costs. Ghost Kitchens provide specialized kitchen space, and because they don't have any added overhead, it helps maximize the profits. A recent example of Ghost Kitchens is when Mr. Beast, a popular social media influencer who simultaneously started 300 restaurants across US and used his brand to drive demand and sell burgers. It was made possible using Ghost Kitchens. It is estimated that the take rates of Ghost Kitchens would be greater than 20, 25% of gross order volume, almost double the regular take rate. Finally, FinTech. Now you might be thinking, where the hell does FinTech fit into DoorDash? DoorDash offers services to Dashers, which allows them to collect interest. Oh, sorry. DoorDash offers wallet services to Dashers, which allows them to collect interest on the balances and takes an interchange fee cut on purchases made by Dashers through their debit cards. DoorDash is also in the process of giving out branded credit cards for its consumers and collect nice interchange fees for the transactions on its marketplace. Now, let's talk about valuation. Last year, due to the pandemic surge, they grew their revenues by a whopping 226%. Interestingly, they were growing at a great rate greater than 200% pre-pandemic as well. The growth is not just a COVID stock story. DoorDash is now trading at an EV gross multiple of 29. The closest comparable to them is Uber, which now trades at roughly 20x, which is growing at a much lower rate. Due to the pull forward in revenue for 2020, due to the pandemic, 2021 growth is expected to be over 30%. DoorDash isn't profitable yet as they are in the hyper growth mode, but as their customer cohorts would mature, they will be more profitable. With the optionalities that I can I think DoorDash is setting itself for high margin businesses, which will boost its top and bottom line significantly in the years to come. Uh, looking to the future, 
despite the covid surge online delivery still represents only 10% of restaurant sales it's still a long way to go compared to e-commerce which is at 20% at the moment with the tools offered by doordash it is technically now possible to sell food right from someone's kitchen or to sell retail right from the garage the possibilities of local economy are mind blowing and doordash is just getting started uh if you are interested in doordash i highly recommend you follow secret capital who is a good friend of mine and anand arvindan uh, uh who both offer great insights into the business at a great detail uh thank you great job man i that was really good i appreciated your time thanks so much for that um moving on to the next speaker i think we have investi analysis with one of my favorites etsy you ready to go aha uh-huh. i'll give it a try <laughs> give it a try okay thanks again max and um uh, mac for doing this and just organizing and bringing everyone together uh morning everybody yeah so i'm just going to talk here about etsy Um, Etsy is a large position of mine, high conviction name of mine. Um, and today, I think I'm going to do my pitch, I guess, if you want to call this a pitch of my talk in um, five theses, right? Five major reasons why I think Etsy could could potentially become a $100 billion company by 2026. Um, so it's structured into five reasons. I've got three on the competitive advantages and two on the financial side of things. In terms of what are the major competitive advantages that Etsy has? So first of all, let's do a primer for those who don't know Etsy. Etsy operates a marketplace to connect buyers and sellers, right? For a large selection of locally made gifts. Um, it could be home decor, jewelry, apparel, clothing, bath, buddy, and now most recently home furnishing right so they have a marketplace that connects buyers and sellers and there's a constant exchange of goods and services um it's primarily a two-sided marketplace so currently as at the end of 2020 um etsy had over 82 million buyers um from 2020 they actually bought and they had sellers of over 4.4 million right so sellers were selling products over to the buyer so I think Etsy could potentially be a future Amazon um, um if I dare say that word but I think it's possible the first reason would be brand recognition um Etsy currently um it's it's this is the most unique part of Etsy is over 80% of purchases are right of gross um merchandise sales of Etsy are 80% are organic buyer right compared to just 20% that's paid by marketing like think about that right there's a high amount of organic it's quite a wide high amount of just organic and habitual and just word of mouth that actually leading people to Etsy it's a, it's a brand um and guess what that helps to improve your customer acquisition cost right it helps to drive that down and Etsy actually saved a bit actually on our marketing last year although they plan to scale that up this year um but I think one thing to know about brand recognition is Etsy it's a, it's a brand name it's a household name and you never want to underestimate the importance of brand right similar to Peloton right or Airbnb right um and I think eventually we might potentially see Etsy for a specific kind of brand so that's a that's a big thing and I think post pandemic um consumers are always going to remember Etsy right everything started from the mask sales that really got your brand going um but i think going forward i think everyone's going to know that Etsy is actually much more than just buying mask um consumers actually love the product right as i said um active buyers grew over 77% habitual buyers are growing over 157% right so this includes repeat purchases so right these are repeat buyers you know um that is growing over 100% and when you think about that like these were people who came for Etsy who came on Etsy for a mask at the match of 2020 however they came back to Etsy later on in the in later quarters why because the product was so good they loved what they got there 
and they were like, wow, I could get way more, right? Um, and so there is a law um, that products, uh, that consumers actually love about them. A second, the second reason why I think they have a major competitive advantage to become a major um, player is just the network effect. And I think we've talked a lot about network effects on you already. Um, but as those habitual buyers, repeat buyers keep coming back, growing over 100%, the sellers on the platforms actually grew over 65% year over year, as well as 20, they made 22% more money, right? So they'll make it a lot more money, actually. So think about, just think about that powerful flywheel, right? And the impact that actually has on, on the platform and just that network effect on the platform. So, and then another thing we know from the pandemic is the seller, and the creator economy is growing massively, right? So think about Substack. Everyone's doing a side gig, and close to about 50% actually of sellers on, on Etsy are actually full-time, actually. And Etsy has actually improved the take rate. This is so important. It was a negative 6% last year, and now their take rate is about 5%. And think about the impact that actually has on your bottom line, your, on your top line, right? So that that's huge. The total redressable market for Etsy would be a third reason why I think they're huge. Is think about I mentioned they're the fourth largest e-commerce brand in the U.S. and they have a total estimated Tamil. They estimate it's over one one point seven trillion. However, let's just even say two hundred and fifty billion, right, for the household related items, right? And think about the potential for them to grow even further on and just leverage and build upon that, right, um, from where they are right now. So I think there's tremendous competitive advantage this company has to keep going. On the financial side, I think these days, the financials are easy. You could see it, right? Revenue grew to <clears throat> $1.7 billion, right? So over 100, and it grew 100, 111% year over year, um, which is just phenomenal for a company that's over at that size. Gross margins grew from just about 50% last year to over 76% in 2020. The EBITDA margins, 32% EBITDA margins, right? So the business is showing huge signs of significant operating leverage, right? And this is what you love to see about a business, especially uh, when they're growing. Um, another metric that I think is extremely hard, and so that goes from financials now to kind of the bottom line metrics are, the return on equity. Uh, we don't talk much about this uh, because a lot of the growth names these days are not just mature. They don't have a lot of that operating leverage. However, Etsy, Etsy started 2020 with a return on equity of just less than 18%. And the end of the year, over 65%. Like that's like the best of the best businesses have an ROI of over 60%, you know? So, I think on the top and the bottom line, um, the business is growing triple digit on the top and the bottom line, and they're showing phenomenal, phenomenal operating leverage. And I think that just sets the bright future. And now I'm going to talk about the bright future that I think they have ahead of them. Um, the home furnishing, we don't realize actually Etsy is benefiting from these, right? That's the fastest growing segment, 118%. Year over year. Um, there's also international penetration. The brand is growing. It's phenomenal growth. And I think that's and people might be worried. Like, so this is the biggest risk. Let's let's talk about the risk. The biggest risk everyone talks about what happens to them post-COVID. Um, well, I think post-COVID, that brand name isn't going anywhere. I think Etsy continues to capture a huge share of the e-commerce, right? E-commerce market. You're going to be capturing a major share of that post-pandemic. And then I also think the biggest competitor, obviously, being Amazon, I think they have a good chance. Um, I mean, obviously, they're, they're, that's competitive of theirs, but I think the differentiation for Etsy is just the brand is known for personalization, human touch, right? It That's far different from what you think about Amazon, which is just fast, quick, and cheap, right? And I think this is a huge differentiation of what Etsy has going for them. So in summary, to wrap up, um, I've given you 
reasons why I think Etsy has the potential. Three competitive advantages of the brand awareness, right? Huge reduces your customer acquisition cost. The powerful network effect of both buyers and sellers benefiting from the platform. The total addressable market, um, and just the being be and Etsy being the number four largest e-commerce brand in the U.S. The financials, the top and the bottom line, the return on equity, everything's growing almost at a triple-digit number. Um, and I think for this reason, and just the brand of Etsy, I think their position um, to be a hundred billion dollar, which should be a multi-bagger from now by twenty thirty. Um, so that's my that's my piece on Etsy. I'm going to be, I'll put out the thread. Um, it's one of my biggest companies. I love putting out threads. So I'll put out my threads on my, I'll put it out in a couple of minutes here on my Twitter page. So you guys could go on my Twitter page, just check them out. And if you have questions, feel free to reach out to me um, at any time at Investy. So thank you very much, Max and Mac. <clears throat> Great job, man. Thanks so much. <clears throat> I think Max's mic is actually broken, so I don't know. I apologize about the technical issues there, but great job, man. Loved your pitch on Etsy. I think we're moving next with Ryan. Uh, we had Daniel talk about <clears throat> brick and mortar e commerce, obviously. Now we're going to get a twist on the uh, e commerce version of, of retail. So without further ado, my Irish accent, Ryan, up next. Uh, well, lads, how's it going? Um... Hope everybody had a good weekend and that. Um, Max, I hope you're or Mark, sorry, hope you're feeling better, buddy. Um, <clears throat> today and stuff, and don't worry, you won't have to time me or anything like that. I had a few too many beers last night, so I'll try and get through this as quick as I can, you know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just in case that. Listen, I think like tell what the guys have spoke so far, great job. <clears throat> I've actually learned a lot and uh, talking in detail about the companies that you spoke to, that was great. And uh, you know, obviously, e-commerce in general is, I think, the future and has been kind of coming, obviously. 2020 with COVID and that accelerated everything at a much quicker level than we thought. But, you know, kind of going into what um, what Daniel was talking about, the brick and mortar not being dead. Like, do I agree or disagree with him? I, uh, I think a bit of both. I don't think saying dead is the right term, you know. But I don't think that, you know, obviously, I, I think we can all say that <clears throat> e-commerce sales are accelerating at a much higher rate than retail sales um, on, on the brick and mortar side of it. But are they dead? No, I don't think they're dead. But I, what I do believe and what I do think is you have the likes of these brick and mortar companies now changing in order to provide something that you just cannot get online. You know, like, for example, we can take Nike, or as we call it back home, Nike. Um, we talk to them, we talk like they've expanded both in New York and both in Shanghai on their brick and mortar. But, you know, what they're doing now and what they're trying to create is a whole new brand new experience at their shopping locations. You know, I think they call them like house of innovation now. And I don't know if anybody's been in one, but I live in New York myself. And like when I go in there, it feels like you're in part of Disneyland at some point. You know, the one they have in midtown Manhattan, you know, they go in, you can personalize things. You get a real, real experience that you simply cannot get online. And I think that that is kind of what Daniel's kind of come to too, where, you know, the older ones that aren't being initiative or creative like that uh, will die out. Like you mentioned, Pennies and Sears and that. But I do believe that there's going to be uh, retail as it is slowing down the brick and mortar side of it but I do believe that you're going to see a change in what they're able to offer what they're going to offer and how they're going to go um, and like I said like, uh, brick and mortar like I said is the future and it's kind of going um, I know Mark is very very keen on C Limited and we talk about different emerging markets like Brazil India South Africa China etc you know and they're expected to be 20, 20% I think in 2022 of the, of the e-commerce sales those markets are markets that I'd be definitely looking at and definitely, definitely be really, really doing a lot of work on um, on, the, on the e-commerce side of things. Um, you know, another thing too with e-commerce is now what companies can make this as easy as possible, as quick as possible. Because I think now in the modern age, people have no patience. People want things now and then. And what now the companies have got to come up with is something to do with how can I get the product to the person as quick as possible. Yes, Amazon have their prime when we talked about DoorDash in 45 minutes, etc. But, you know, I think... The, the the big issue now is going to be on the phone is who can order and who can provide that experience on the phone the best. Yes, I think desktop has been over the last six, seven, eight, nine, ten years, whatever it is, the sales have been going better. But I believe that over the last two, couple of years, sales on the mobile phone are now overtaking desktops. And I think now at the moment, everybody that has a phone and anybody that can buy something online on their phone and get exactly what they want, that's a much easier way. <laughs> Another thing with e-commerce is 
And I think what a lot of companies are going to have to focus on is going to be the video side of things and what they've got. You know, I think 62% of them after seeing a video rather than reading about something. And, and that even goes into my own business. Like I have a bar in New York City. And what, you know, I have a discussion. That I'm making, I find that people buy that, and that's a simple um, comparison. But it's kind of the same of which companies now are going to provide a platform on your phone where the video is out of a quality <clears throat> as better or than the competitors are better than anybody else um, that, that, that they're competing against. And that video, I think, will be much more appealing than just going on your phone and reading about a description of a product. Um, you know, I think what I'd be looking at now is obviously we all know the e-commerce is leading and stuff. Um, <clears throat> 2025, you know, I'm looking at what's going to be a leading head, what's going to be leading uh, the e-commerce on top of that. And I know fashion, you know, is expected to be the largest come 2025, coming in at one trillion. And then secondly, surprisingly, I didn't actually think this, but secondly, you have toys and hobby. Now they're going to be the second biggest at 766 billion. And then third, you've got the electronics that I actually thought would have been around second, but there's not much between the top, the two and the three, to be honest with you. But come 2025, if they're biggest, there's going to be electronics and media, and that's going to be about 740, 750 billion. Um, so we can see that the trend is going all this way, and <clears throat> exactly like COVID did last year, accelerated uh, everything to a certain level. Um, you know, by 2025, we expect it to be a 4.9 billion users of e-commerce in the world, you know? And that's a fucking crazy number. Um, and when I look at e-commerce and stuff, I try to look at, like I say, at markets that maybe, you know, have been covered here and there, but not really in the detail. And I look at India. India, uh, for myself, I've been looking into quite a lot lately. And India by 2025 is supposed to be high e-commerce sales of 188 billion. And we look at that compared to now, it's a crazy amount. And what did surprise me too was by 2034, India is supposed to surpass the US in total sales. For me, when I'm reading that, I'm thinking to myself, that's something in the market that I definitely want to look into, definitely, definitely check. And then when I was doing more work on it, you know, we have uh, smartphone users, r- smartphone users, sorry, rise by 84% by 2022 in India. You know, and if, if that's going to rise by 84% by then, by 2022, you can only imagine what's going to happen with 5G and everything after that. And the biggest problem with India in particular, and kind of the concerns were, you know, India always had a culture and stuff, a belief of, you know, I can't touch, won't buy. You know, the attitude was always like, uh, they would rather go into a store and pick things up. And then there was also fears of like fraud, a lot of scams and a lot of uh, data theft that was always affecting people and always putting people off. And then also like the logistics in India, you know, where like, for example, the courier companies couldn't cover certain regions and stuff. And that meant that it was hard, it was losing out, our companies were losing out and potential customers because they were depending on that online to come and it wasn't able to be delivered or whatever it may be. Yeah. But over the last two or three years, you've saw that Amazon India have made a made India store and have lumped a large amount of money into that. Um, and that goes back to, you know, the toys being the second largest in 2020, uh, 2025 market. You see Amazon making moves in the, about their toy store. And then Flipkart, I don't know if anybody's aware, but like Flipkart, one of the biggest companies in India, you know, they acquired a 7.8% stake in Adia Berla fashion. And again, fashion is supposed to be the number one. And I'm not sure if, again, if anybody's aware, which I wasn't, uh, Flipkart. Um, I remember when I checked it out, I remembered, but I actually forgot about it. But Walmart was 77% on their stake in them. Uh, so I would say well, we're spending that money see that a massive massive market in there too and then there's been also been a massive amount of money invested um, by the government in India towards uh, digitalizing payments digitalizing transport to make it easier for everybody so India is kind of a market that I've been really really looking at I think that e-commerce um, could do <clears throat> could do extremely well over the next uh, 5, 10, 15 years and I think that that's a market that I'll definitely be planning but that's kind of all I really want to cover in e-commerce. You know, I, mean, I know, I know other people are going to talk more specific or it's simple, comp- or it's, uh, separate companies. Um, but I just want to kind of overcome and overstay about e-commerce itself. But I do believe that India is a, is a market that, you know, over the next two, three, four years, might build slowly, slowly. But I definitely think five, 10, 15 years now, it's going to be a massive leader. I'm going to pray really good rewards for us, anybody that's investing in it. But that's Ken. All I got to say, Marco Kid. That's all. Um, I have a man's in a minute. And anybody, any question or anything, they can hit me with it. Any questions? Any... Okay, cool. Thanks, Ryan. I appreciate it. Good job, man. Uh, just a quick announcement. So, Max's 
uh, spaces is actually broken right now, so he can't talk at all. So we're going to do Gannon next with Walmart. Uh, kind of a good segue since Ryan just spoke about Walmart at the end there. But after Gannon goes, we're going to restart the spaces because Max has to actually speak. And he can't speak about Ozone if uh, his mic doesn't work. So we're just going to have to restart it after this one. So Gannon, uh, if you're ready to go, feel free, man. Yeah. Uh, Mark, can you hear me well? Yes. Go ahead. Sorry. Okay. Perfect. Thank you very much, Max and Mark, for, for setting this up. Um and thank you, Ryan, for perfectly segueing what I'm going to talk about, which is Walmart. Um, you know, there's a lot of good names spoken in this space already. I'm the shareholder of, you know, Etsy and others. Um, I kind of want to do something untraditional and kind of just take you through the journey of why I bought Walmart, why I sold Walmart, why I'm, why I'm reconsidering right now, probably this week, re-entering Walmart. Um, you know, Walmart, we all know Walmart. It's been around for, you know, decades. Um, I'm not going to go into the brick and mortar side. I'm going to just focus on the e-commerce side. It's a massive company, obviously. So it's kind of hard to, um, cover the whole company in 10 minutes, but over Walmart plus, um, and why I entered at 120, exited at around 140 and then First off, for those that don't know, um, I think that Walmart, with their announcement of Walmart Plus, has strategic advantages, um, especially when they're going head to head with Amazon. Um, anything that I say in this, you know, is my opinion. Uh, I'm not an Amazon bear by any means. Um, I think there's, you know, room for for many e-commerce companies to have great gains um as we have seen the whole space is you know just really been on the up and up so walmart plus is basically like amazon prime you get free delivery of anything you'd want in a normal walmart um you got some other advantages like it's 98 dollars a year versus amazon's 119 dollars a year it can be from your phone or computer you save five cents per gallon on fuel at walmart stations and obviously, it's free delivery for anything you would find in a normal Walmart. Um, just right there, starting off, that kind of caught my eye because we've all ordered things on Amazon that are just complete crap. I'm not saying Amazon, ha uh, Walmart has the best products, but there is some sort of process where they go, okay, no, we can't sell this. This is crap. This isn't crap. Um, if you haven't <laughs> ordered uh, something on Amazon that is, you know, complete crap, then you probably haven't ordered a lot of things because I've gotten some items that just kind of no vetting process. Um, so there's a slight advantage there, in my opinion. Now, where I focus on Walmart and what got me first intrigued was my oldest brother-in-law is he owns a truck driving business and he, you know, just he likes the stock market. And he reached out to me and talked about how orders of Walmart trucking have just, you know, exploded. This, of course, was in the middle of the pandemic. So that kind of caught my eye. Um, and another thing that brought me on to it was I used, you know, my first job in high school was I was a grocery bagger at Kroger and uh, Walmart has been known as the biggest grocery chain in the, in the United States um, by far. I think Walmart, where they've really hurt themselves is their branding. Um, a lot of people just associate Walmart with all the negative things about Walmart um, when they don't realize how huge of a company it is, how uh, dominant of a player they are in the grocery store space. Um, in 2019, they were number one with 50% of their sales, 288 billion coming from their grocery. Amazon's Whole Foods is 10th on this list in 20, 2019, with revenues estimated at, at 16 billion, coming from only 500 stores. Um, so here's the huge edge that I see that Walmart has with Amazon is simply transportation. We all know Amazon has had trouble um, when it comes to getting products from A to B. And the thing is with grocery, that is a huge deal. Um, you know, when I buy groceries, I don't want them to take 
uh, two days. I want them fresh here now. Walmart has 4,756 U.S. stores, 11,500 worldwide, versus Amazon's 589 physical stores, including their Whole Foods stores. So, I mean, it's not rocket science. More stores is a huge advantage to deliver those groceries on a same-day basis. Um, I'm not going to, again, I'm not going to go into like the it's obviously a value play. At least five years ago, Walmart is you know, just traditional value play. But I do see that it's shifting over to this possible, you know, possible rev, uh, growth play as, you know, but their value is kind of their hedge. Um, so moving on, why I bought Walmart was they're coming out with Walmart Plus. The problem was when they came out with Walmart Plus, they just were silent on the subscription numbers for months. And as a shareholder, that obviously was <laughs> very concerning. Okay, well, if, if they're so huge about this Walmart Plus move and how they can be the, the top tier um, same day grocery uh, e-commerce vehicle, why are they being so silent about it? So, um, after the membership program came out, I, I can't remember what exact quarter it was in 2020. I decided to leave my position at about 138. Um, and then months later, very recently, basically these Walmart Plus numbers started to roll out. And that's why you saw that large share price increase up to the 150s. Luckily, it's back down to the 140s. So that would kind of get me back in if I wanted to um, back where I started. <laughs> So the Walmart Plus numbers did indicate that it garnered between 7.4 million and 8.2 million members, which is a very you know promising start. Um, customers spend on average about $1,000 at walmart.com per year, um, which is very similar to the long-term figure for, for Amazon. Walmart Plus members currently account for about 13% to 14% of total walmart.com shoppers as of January 30th, uh, 2021. Um, so the big box retailer took over Amazon spot as a top grocery e-commerce platform pretty single-handedly, like very easily, which wasn't a huge surprise. And that's kind of why I got into Walmart in the first place was because just logistically, they have such a massive monopoly slash advantage over Amazon. I think a lot of people, when I first started talking about Walmart on Twitter, I did a thread. Uh, I got a lot of hate because people were trying to say that I, I think Walmart's going to take over Amazon. I, I don't think that's the I was simply talking about groceries. And Walmart does um, enough on its own without Walmart. I saw that kind of risk-reward scenario where it's like, even if this Walmart Plus thing doesn't take off, they're fine. They do $589 billion in revenue per year, uh, around $500 billion before even Walmart Plus was announced. Um, so about 30% of online grocery transactions came from Walmart, while Amazon only accounts for about 27%, which was down from 33% in 2019, this recent survey found. Um, Walmart delayed the rollout of this Walmart Plus sub subscription service for months. That's what was making me hesitant in my journey of, you know, buying and selling and now reconsidering coming back in. But a survey from, uh, I'm going to butcher this name, Pip Slay, and showed that 11% of Americans subscribed to Walmart Plus in the first two weeks of its launch, and about 19% of those subscribers turned to Walmart Plus from Prime, suggesting some competition between the two. Um you know, it kind of makes sense in my mind, because if you are a Walmart shopper, if you have a Walmart right next to you and you want your groceries today, I think Walmart Plus in the future is going to continue to provide that um, that value where you don't know when you're, there hasn't been a foundation that any other e-commerce platform besides, I guess, Instacart has been the dominant player and Walmart for decades 
has been the dominant player by a large margin in just the grocery store, brick and mortar grocery store space. And, and sorry for that. That was my computer. Um, and now when they flipped over to uh, Walmart plus, it was just pretty seamless transaction. Um, yeah, and hopefully I didn't go too long. That's that's my piece on Walmart. That's why I'm looking to get back in. We saw that, you know, 2021 annual revenue growth go up 6.72%. Last 2020, it was 1.86%. So we're seeing, you know, these revenues coming up. Um, and I think that they're going to have this grocery store e-commerce market pretty much covered when you have almost 5,000 stores in the US and 11,000 worldwide. That's very hard for Amazon to compete with when they only got, you know, 500. Great job, Gannon. I uh, appreciate your insight on Walmart. I hate to do this right now, but since Max is having microphone issues, we're going to have to restart the spaces. I think he asked me if people could reshare it. It's up to you. It's no big deal if you can't, but Max is going to end this. We're going to come right back on. It's going to be Max, and then Anthony's going to talk about C Limited, and I'm sure everybody's going to want to hear that. So uh, I think we're going to get restarted here again. Hey guys, can you hear me? Mark, can you hear me? Yeah, it's finally working for you. I don't know what's going on. I have no idea. And it's just so frustrating, honestly, guys. I'm sorry that I had to restart it, but uh, it is what it is. And uh, we either had to completely remove my presentation or we just have to keep going. So I'm glad that it's working out. I think Jack Dorsey sent me a DM saying he didn't want to hear what I was on. So he muted you. From Eric Schott. Is he going to join us? Yeah, I wish. You can repeat a board of experts. So I'm going to wait for like one minute to let people rejoin. And then we're going to go ahead and uh, get started here. And we're going to pass a on our board that are going to bring talent, expertise, and sponsorship to this. Hey, is it Anthony that I hear? Oh, so yes. Sorry, I was literally reading a, a piece of research right now. Apologies. <laughs> it's so it's, it's all good. I'm just uh, yeah. If uh, all of you guys can um, reshare the link, that would be very helpful. So we can gather the crowd and uh, keep moving. I'm gonna wait for like one minute and then we're gonna keep going. So far, every single presentation was awesome. Thank you so much for every speaker. That was incredible. I love it. Great job, Mark, moderating the event. Yeah. And uh, so we just prefer, give it a minute. Guys prefer, sorry to cut you off. Do you guys prefer these 10 minute blurbs? Is this more helpful? Because I know last time the last event was like five hours or so. And I don't know if that was too long. If you guys want to put like a hundred, like a thumbs down, thumbs up. Do you like this format better? Like, what do you guys think? Or if anybody wants to talk real quick while we're waiting, I don't know. Uh, I, I'm I'm good with whatever. Yeah, I don't know. I'm excited to hear about Ozone. Well, honestly, I think that uh, moving forward, we're going to have about uh, 10 speakers per event and uh, 10 minutes per person will be perfect because the very first uh, event was great. We gathered a lot of people. There was a lot of industries covered. and uh, But I think it was two and a half hours. That was just too exhausting for everyone, for all the speakers. I feel bad. So it was definitely a financial fitness marathon, not a prologue. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that 10 minutes per, per person and just keep it from like two to four, about two hours, short and sweet and move on. So I think that's the perfect format. It's cool to hear everyone's voice I, to, to be able to kind of connect the, the tweets that I've been reading for the last year with, with voices. Yeah, it is kind of cool. It's kind of like we're getting more intimate with each other. I don't know if that's the right <laughs> word, but... Uh... Sure, know. intimate, is, intimate. Is that the right word? Maybe I'm off there. But I feel like I don't know. it's almost like we're all collaborating over text and everybody's learning and now you can like speak to each other and um, it's almost like you know each other in real life now. Yeah. Yeah, I think Twitter Spaces is a great platform and uh, I think uh, 
Wolf has been doing a great job bringing people together and uh, bringing as much value as possible to um, all of us. And the, this has been great. I just wish that it would be working a little bit better and we wouldn't have any issues like right now. Well, I think, I think it's all good. I, think, I, I mean, 200 people joined back, so I think you're, you're good to go. Okay, uh, sounds good. So I'm going to go ahead and get it started. When it comes to e-commerce, um, typically the first countries that come to mind are U.S., China, Russia, maybe India. But uh, what do all these countries have in common? I think the answer is a large population. From all the countries I just mentioned, uh, which country has the lowest e-commerce penetration? It's Russia. And the company that is well-positioned to benefit in the future and dominate the market in Russia, in my personal opinion, is Ozone. So this is exactly what I will be talking about today. But before I dive into Ozone, um, I think it's a pretty cool story I wanted to share with you guys. Um, I think a couple days ago, um, the folks from Industry Focus Podcast um, hosted their very first Twitter Spaces event. And then at the end, they had a quick Q&A session. And I was fortunate enough to be able to ask a question. So I wanted to ask all of the speakers what they thought about Ozone. And to my surprise, neither of the speakers were either into this company or never even heard about this. So I was like, hmm, that's pretty interesting. So I think that uh, bringing awareness to this company, and since this is a relatively new publicly traded company, I think they went IPO last year around November, uh, about six months now. And uh, plus, of course, uh, on the other side, there is a huge amount of risk uh, when it comes to Russia or China or any other companies. And I get it. This is definitely a risk to take into consideration when you make an investment. But I think the upside here is definitely greater than the downside. And uh, I would like to talk about this company and show you guys why I'm so bullish about this. So first, I would like to touch on Russia and the state of e-commerce industry in Russia. Russia is the 11th largest con uh, economy in the world and is the most populous country. But Russia is lagging behind when it comes to e-commerce penetration. I think only about 6% of Russian retail sales took place online. So to put it in perspective, there was almost one-third of the U.S. rate, which was about 20%. In one third of the rate of China, which was about 28%. That's a pretty staggering difference. But good news that lower market penetration means more room to grow and the possibility of higher growth rates. And this is exactly what I want to see in the industries that I personally invest in. So when it comes to 2020, uh, Russian e-commerce grew at a pretty impressive annual rate of uh, about 43%. The, major, the majority of this growth is definitely attributed to the global pandemic. But I truly believe that this trend is not going anywhere and is here to stay. And the value of Russian e-commerce market is estimated to actually triple from 2020 to 2024. So I don't know about you guys, but I definitely would like to have some exposure in this market with this kind of rate of growth. Uh, when I was uh, actually doing my due diligence on Ozone prior to making my first investment in this company and was going over their S1, a couple of things that stood out to me. First is um, the payment methods that these Russians are using when it comes to e-commerce. Online payments grew uh, from 31% in 2016 all the way to 65% in 2020. That's almost doubling. But when it comes to cash transactions, they actually decreased from 29% in 2016 all the way to 6% in 2020. So based on this information, we clearly can see that uh, Russians are adopting online payments and the cash has been utilized on fewer occasions. And uh, all of these, I think, directly benefits the adoption of e-commerce in Russia. So next, uh, I would like to talk a, a little bit about the domestic e-commerce players in Russia. Uh, the entire uh, sector is highly fragmented uh, and with the top three domestic e-commerce companies accounting for approximately 18 percent of the total e-commerce market and this number is actually significantly lower compared to the market share of the top three e-commerce companies in in some other countries so the three major players in russia right now are wildberries which is now publicly traded second one is m video and the third one is ozone and Ozone, this is the one that uh, I would like to talk about right now. 
So the company was founded in 1998 as an online book and DVD retailer. I think this is exactly where this comparison comes from. A lot of people call Ozone Amazon of Russia, as it was uh, also invented as a bookstore at the beginning and then starts growing. And Ozone's core addressable market is the Russian retail market, which was the fourth largest retail market in Europe. The company's ownership includes two main shareholders. Each of the shareholders has approximately 45% ownership. The first one is Baron Vostok, and the second one is Sistema. Just a quick overview of these shareholders. Um, So Baron Vostok, the one that owns 45%, is the largest independent private equity firm, which is focused on investments in Russia. They typically invest in uh, fields like oil, gas, consumer products, media, technology. Uh, And the second one is Sistema. Sistema is a Russian investment holding company that is actually listed on London Stock Exchange. Some of the other holdings of Sistema include MTS, which is Russia's largest mobile phone network, Medsi, which is Russia's largest private healthcare chain. It has approximately like 48 facilities. It's huge in Russia. And STEP, which is the huge agriculture players in Russia. So both of these companies own approximately 90% of uh, Ozone. It's a risk, uh, definitely, but uh, so far the management has been doing a great job with Ozone, so I'm very excited. And speaking of management, management is one of the key areas that I personally pay very close attention to. I think I posted this thread about a month or two ago with a detailed overview of each executive uh, member of Ozone. So if you guys would like to hear more about this, just feel free to DM me and I will uh, be more than happy to share with you guys. The current CEO of Ozone is Alexander Shulgin. He was appointed in December 2017. Prior to Ozone, he was um, uh, with Yandex uh, as a CEO and CFO. He will spend there quite some time, and Yandex is one of the main competitors of Ozone right now. So they used to be just fully concentrated in, uh, uh, like, web services. It was sort of like a Google of uh, Russia. But now I see this trend in Russia that all of these big players with deep pockets heavily invested in e-commerce, which is, I think it's a good testament that they see this tremendous potential in e-commerce in Russia, which I'm pretty excited about. So Ozone represents approximately 7% of overall domestic Russian e-commerce market. It was at least based on 2020 numbers. I haven't seen any 2021 numbers yet. So as soon as I find out more, I will share with you guys. And Ozone is the leading e-commerce business in terms of offering the widest range of products and uh, selection of delivery options. So some of the products include electronics, home goods, uh, health and beauty, pharmaceuticals, and books actually account for only 5%. So it started as a bookstore, now it's only 5%, so you can clearly see how far this company came. Even though Ozone is not the largest market player in Russia, it is definitely the most recognized e-commerce brand in Russia. About 32% brand awareness compared to 18% for the next highest competitor, which is Wildberries. So this is pretty much twice the rate of Wildberries. So the company is growing very fast. And I think in the next couple of years, Ozone should overtake Wildberries when it comes to logistics and infrastructure. But I will touch on this a little bit later now let's touch on one of the areas that I'm the most excited. It's Ozone is well positioned to become the leader in Russia and dominate the e-commerce industry as it develops one of the largest and most sophisticated logistic infrastructures in the Russian e-commerce market with about nine fulfillment centers and delivery infrastructure. That's massive. Like I said, as of right now, Wildberries is number one when it comes to infrastructure, but Ozone has plenty of cash and they've been reinvesting all of their cash and all the IPO proceeds into building more and more fulfillment centers, logistics and infrastructure. This is exactly why I think it's well positioned to benefit in the future. When it comes to deliveries, Ozone offers same-day delivery services in Moscow and St. Petersburg, as well as the next-day delivery coverage for approximately 40% of the Russian population. So that's pretty 
pretty massive. Uh, so the next, I would like to talk about the company's fundamentals. Um, if I'm not mistaken, on March 30th, the company released its uh, first earnings report as a publicly traded company. And I would like to go over some of the highlights. Uh, let's start with the mar uh, marketplace. Marketplace is the core pillar of Ozone's business. So number of active buyers on, almost, uh, on Ozone's platform increased 75% year over year to about 14 million as of December 2020 compared to 7.9 million in the previous year. That's pretty much doubling. And the number of sellers on Ozone platform quadrupled in Q4 2020 compared to 2019. Number of orders increased to 73.9 million, growing by 132% year over year. And the share of marketplace reached approximately 49% as percentage of growth merchandise value. It's up from 17%. So when it comes to micro, uh, marketplace, I think the amount of revenues they generated from this platform pretty much tripled in 2020. Of course, like I mentioned before, the majority of this growth is attributed to global pandemic, but uh, I think it's going to keep going that way. So just to summarize it all, I was extremely excited about the company's first earnings report, and I believe the executive team did a great job during the call. Its revenue growth was very strong. As I mentioned before, guidance was impressive. I think they anticipated they're going to keep growing at approximately 95% rate in the future. So its growth is not going anywhere and it's here to stay. So I'm very excited to keep observing the company and keep going over their earnings reports. And so this is pretty much why I'm along Ozone. So this is uh, the end of my presentation. I'm sorry, Mark, if I um, went over my 10 minute a lot of time. Great job, Max. I appreciate you giving us some yeah. more info on Ozone. Um, yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah, absolutely. And really quick before we move to Anthony, which I'm super excited uh, uh, to hear about. SE and Mail is definitely one of my favorite companies when it comes to e-commerce. I would like to make an announcement real quick. So today we're hosting Chapter 1. In two weeks on May 2nd, we're going to have our Chapter 2, which will be dedicated to fintech and digital payments so i'm gonna go ahead and tweet all the details right now we're gonna have 10 speakers uh, covering different sectors in this uh, different companies so i'm very excited to announce it uh, and mark will be moderating this event as well and i'm hoping that we're not gonna have any issues with my twitter spaces i think this is a fluke i think you'll be good <laughs> And then, yeah, so moving forward, obviously we have Anthony next. I know nobody on FinTwit likes the company he's going to talk about, probably the most hated <laughs> company. Uh, we're going to talk about C Limited next, so go ahead, man. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. I'm excited to, to come on for my first Twitter space and uh, putting this all together for everyone. Yeah, I think you guys are putting me in a little bit of a tough spot here to talk about SCE and Mealy together for 10 minutes, but I'll do my best. I usually have an hour. So. I'll, give you, I'll give you 13. 13, I can do it. All right. Um, so I just want to start off by saying I think a lot of us know the companies, and I'll get into them and just give a little primer later on, but I just want to kind of go into the the reason why we're talking about SC and Mealy. It's mainly because C Limited moved into Latin America quite quickly and swiftly. And uh, for me, when that was all happening, it was kind of around this idea of, you know, the value compression could happen in these higher uh, growth names, which obviously C Limited and Mercado Libre are. So I, I don't really like to have idiosyncratic risk, risk mixed in with that systematic risk from just, you know, being in a higher growth space in and of, of, of itself. Because, you know, if SC is moving into Latin America, my whole process in thinking was that, well, that app download uh, graph that we were seeing everywhere and how quickly they were coming into those chart highs, they were in the top one, two, three, four, five, they were moving in those places. And, and they're showing a lot of strength there continuously. But my whole thought was just, you know, it's very black and white in the market when everyone's selling stocks that are going to be great companies long term, but you know, it, for the short term, they're scared. And so for that reason, I was out of Mealy and, and doubled down into SE. Um, but I did actually look a lot more into it because of coming on this Twitter space. So I'm going to go into all that now. Uh, I think what's really important in the markets these days, I think a lot of people, at least in the short term, are super focused on fundamentals. And of course, these two companies are uh, no slouches in that space, right? So C-Limited, $128 billion market cap. 
going to do about 7.9 billion in revs this year, uh, lose about 1.13 billion. But you know, this is that Amazon growth stage, hyper growth company. And, and I prefer it this way, right? Because if you look at to, you know, 2024, 2025, they're going to be putting up 18 billion in 2024 and 23 billion projected, of course, uh, in 2025 with 6.5 billion in profits, right? So you're you're ex- expecting now that they're going to be spending a ton of this money to do things like move into another continent and uh, break out these new business legs that they're moving into. And they've got a lot of cash still, you know, they're about 7.5 billion. Um, free cash flow has been negative, sure, but, you know, Amazon's was as well. Um, and also Mealy, you know, they have a better cash holding, I would say, uh, overall, just looking financially, they're a little stronger. Um, less expensive than C-Limited is, and Mealy was profitable and, and is projected to continue being profitable. Um, but in my opinion, right, looking at those things a little bit different, right, Mealy's got an $80 billion market cap, looking to do $5.8 uh, billion and $70 million in profit this year. And then out to the same, you know, 2024, 2025, they're going to do roughly the same numbers, $14 billion, $18.8 billion, uh, $1.7 billion profit, $3 billion in profit, right? So these companies are not like these crazy super overvalued companies, and they're growing very, very quickly, right? Like uh, C-Limit is trading barely uh, 12 times next year's sales, right? And, and same with Mercado Libre is about 10 times next year's sales. So for me, those are not really those super growth worrisome plays. Those are more of those becoming from growth to value plays. Um, which is why I'm always looking into them. But that did scare me initially, knowing that uh, Mercado Libre was going to get that fire from C Limited coming into their area. However, upon looking further, right, I've, I've noticed why those numbers were so insane for those mobile downloads for SE and such. It's just kind of their playbook, right? They do cross promotion from their gaming. That's their big profit leg. They've got these, uh, I mean, they got free shipping and lower take rate commissions. So that's like very much so a huge uh, benefit to them getting into this space. And they sell these fast, you know, cheap products a lot of the time, aggressively subsidizing products, and they try to lock users into that payment ecosystem. And that's what helped it work in, you know, Asia and South and um, just in general over there against Alibaba and other competitors. And they're a six headed monster, right? So they're getting money from Garena, which is I'm sure you guys have heard about Free Fire, the video game. It's just an absolute monster all over the world. Shopee's their e-commerce leg, Shopee Pay. Uh, C Capital is new, so they you know they put a billion dollars away to do those investments, kind of in my opinion like Tencent did to them. Uh, AI Labs, which you know that's going to be all the rage. I mean, people are just beginning to move into that, and they've got this profit, or they will have this this profit in the future that's going to allow these things to grow so much further. And they're not scared to take on these new legs. And I love when companies are able to stand on more than one leg; it makes them stronger in the long run. So they're working on food delivery as well in Latin America. Um, but, you know, so is Mealy. And that's the thing that really made me change my mind here. And I'm looking to see in earnings in, in, a coming, in the coming weeks to see if Mealy can still uphold itself and, and, and have that stronghold in the region. I just don't want to see them take too much of a hit because of C's growth in that area. Right. So that's what I kind of said would change my thesis on um, picking C Limited over Mealy. However, you know, digging more into it, knowing that Mercado Libre has been kind of very much so trying to be expanding into these new legs as well. They're, they just put $1.75 billion in Brazil. They're putting a ton of money into Mexico. They're starting their food delivery leg as well. And just to put into perspective, Latin America with 650 million plus people, the infrastructure, access to internet, you know, the, the gaming in Latin, all these things are very much so non-developed. They, they, they have a lot of room to grow. And knowing that e-commerce penetration is hardly 6% there, and the infrastructure, all the other rates for all those things are quite low, very, very low compared to the United States for example, that for me says that there will be room for two people to grow and, and probably, of course, more, right? It's never just really one a winner takes all situation when the infrastructure is hard to, to get across and there's different benefits and uh, hardships that each company here will face. Um, but just Mercado Libre, for example, I'll, I'll give you guys a little bit of background on that more so. I know a lot of people, almost everyone loves this company, but just for case you've never heard of it, um, their mission statement is our company was born with a purpose to democratize commerce and money, equalizing the opportunities between large companies and small entrepreneurs by reducing uh, geographical and economic gaps. So that's so many of the trends that we've been talking about on, on Twitter and just in, in the financial world for a couple of years now. And that's really what's kind of moving these companies forward as these growth companies to produce these very, very high growing revenues year over year and expected profits that will start coming in more and more. Like you just saw Mealy start to turn its first couple of uh, profitable quarters over the last year. So that's kind of great to see. They love to innovate in fintech. That's one of their biggest things. They have this huge technology infrastructure, their IT all over with Mercado Pago, um, fantastic management team there. And they're very, very capable at scaling. They just bought seven new planes for the logistics leg. 
And so now that I have been digging more into it and I've looked at their like recent sustainability report and a bunch of other articles about it, it looks like they're becoming more like SC. It looks like they're starting to have more than just the legs that they already have, right? So they've got Mercado Libre, 720 million products sold last year. Mercado Pago, 117 plus million users in the area of Latin America. And now that, you know, they're really starting to get these new ones like Mercado ads and Mercado shops, which is very, very similar to like Shopify in a sense. So Mercado Envio, so their logistics legs, they ship 650 million shipments. So that's the difficulty that SC has in the region, right? So they're not able to have that infrastructure, that long-standing understanding of where the area needs the most attention at the time and where they'll be most profitable in executing their logistics network. Um, so just a little comparison between them and Latin America, and I'm just talking fast because I want to make sure not run out of time. Um, so C is just starting to begin to really take some strong share over there, but it's clear that Melee has taken a little bit of a hit. If you can just look at the Google search trends, you can see SE has been trending higher in the area since April of 2020. And you know, just for reference, Google is 97% used in Latin America. So that's a very, very good indicator. That was something I just wanted to cross-reference to make sure it wasn't just a, a bad indicator. Um, but NC has managed to overtake those monthly active users in less than two years on a chart I saw on Twitter. Um, then I looked more into it and I saw that SC's focus is so much more on mobile, right? This execution, it, it's its how they grew in so many areas that they've already done, right? So they get in there with their video games and then they, they promote it with, their, their, their shopping app and it goes into they try to lock them into this payment system and it tries to be this ecosystem kind of like Mealy is it's like this infrastructure of Latin America and SE tries to do that wherever they go um, and, and the same with their secrets of success in Asia is that that free shipping mobile first strategy and hyper localization so they really do focus so much more on this mobile growth space and then they try to work that into everything else that they have coming um, but I will say I was just just to point out these Google charts um, from like 100 back in uh, about May of 2020, uh, and the interest of Mercado uh, Libre went down to about 68. And then, you know, uh, C Limited took up a lot of it. However, I believe that C Limited is going to be taking a lot of share from the other people in the area who are less skilled and less adept as Mealy to take over that area, such as Alibaba and um, Wish other companies like that who are having that impact in, in, in the area and, and even Amazon's beginning to start moving down in there in some senses. And I think that those companies are less used to getting into areas that have less infrastructure and that require more uh, to just be successful and really get a great stronghold grip in there. So the, the, the more that I think about it, the more data that I see is that while there is, you know, 94% of the e-commerce to grow, a ton of the payment infrastructure to grow, uh, a ton of all these logistics networks to grow in the area, it's definitely not going to be a winner take all situation. And so, you know, that idiosyncratic risk of everything was falling in the markets, these growth names were all getting hit is just thinking, you know, that's another nail in the coffin that could drive Mealy lower. Um, but I am really actually now thinking that Mealy is going to be quite strong in the area regardless. I mean, they are the leaders. They've been there for so long. Um, and there's still so many other issues that C has to get over. Right. Like just because they can get these huge downloads on mobile because of their heav heavy advertising on TikTok and cross promotion from Garena, it, it does not mean that SC's just, you know, walked in there one day and everything's set up. You know, they have slow shipping 30 days for cross border goods. That's quite not that's quite bad, honestly, like that, that will not be good in the long term. And they're going to have to put about five hundred million dollars into building out those logistics to make it appropriate for, you know, competitive nature in uh, between them and Mealy and the other guys in the area. Um, they've also. Mealy is also continuing to expand in those logistics, right? Another $400 million, increasing that to $700 million annually through 2025, right? So they're going to continue getting that stronghold infrastructure that they already have so well. Um, and SE is going to try to make up and get to that in some point, but they're just not going to be able to take over, I think, in the speed uh, or the strength at which Mealy has a stronghold there, you know, and to gain that Latin American exposure, they're going to have to keep spending a ton of those logistics dollars and to make those distribution centers and make the free shipping comparable. Um, but yeah, they can still take from Wish, AliExpress. And I just don't think that there's going to be anything here in, in the next 10 years. It's not going to be seeing SE and Mealy, you know, maybe working together or, you know, having certain things because SE does, you know, use Shopee to pay, for example, in the area. They have to use third party payments because it's not available as a consumer solution in the country yet where, you know, Mercado Libre has uh, Pago Wallet, like that's the standard in the area, right? So I think that there's a lot of benefits uh, to both actually being in the area. It'll overall drive up that infrastructure that they'll both be able to piggyback off of. 
And, you know, competition does breed innovation. So I'm looking forward to see the other legs that Mercado Libre and SE both get into together or on their own and just grow that infrastructure in the area that needs it uh, over the next coming decades. Is it is it? it? Oh, was, it was it already 13 minutes? Um, I didn't have a chance to time it. And uh, it Mark, was, what do you say? It was 13 for sure. I Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. That was great. It was actually 17 seconds over time, so we didn't have to work on that. <laughs> this is so unacceptable. Yeah, yeah. I'm have to rethink my next invitation to end in this. Okay, so. I'll fire myself. It's okay. <laughs> no, thanks, <laughs> Thank you. So moving forward, I think we have plan. Uh, talk about Mercari. Um, thanks a lot again, Anthony. I think you did a great job. And plant whenever you're ready. If you want to go, go ahead. Yeah. Hey, how, how's it going? Um, yeah. So first of all, I'll say this is not really a, a stock pitch. I'd probably say, um, I don't know. I don't know if I'd recommend you buy it or not. I, I have some, but um, there are some risks and um, potential drawdowns to come, depending on what happens with some of their U.S. lines. But, um, you know, when I first started looking at this company, I – wasn't really sure what it was because you see some advertisements um, on TV. They've started uh, campaigning for Mercari in the U.S. Uh, and then I, tr I tried looking at it online, and there were literally zero deep dives. Um, so I just kind of wanted to create a deep dive. And so what I did was on my my uh, review, you can see it on my on my Twitter page. You can see uh, a full deep dive that kind of explains all of their business lines. It's a lot more complicated than it might seem. So I'll just give a kind of a piece of that and kind of explain what the company is and and um, kind of move forward from there. So Mercari's sort of central businesses are C2C uh, marketplaces, a consumer to consumer. Um, they operate primarily in Japan uh, in the U.S. And so people can buy and sell um, primarily used items, although not exclusively. The app-based marketplace, it's a closed platform where buyers and sellers, they have a safe and secure uh, transaction by eliminating physical contact and payment risk. So Macari allows anonymity on the platform while still requiring ID verification, uh, indirect sales, um, and then they offer shipping only, unlike sites like Craigslist or LetGo uh, that conduct the transactions in person. So they actually collect and hold the payment in escrow until delivery, and they offer partnered shipping options through uh, various um, vendors, depending on if it's in Japan or U the U.S., um, they generally take a 10% cut of the purchase price from the seller and they have other monetization opportunities like payment processing, credit authentication, and others. So they encourage a treasure hunt style shopping experience and allow chat between buyers and sellers. And they have some social elements like liking posts, et cetera. Uh, they use a reputation st system similar to Uber or eBay where buyers and sellers must rate each other. Uh, sellers are actually required to rate the buyers before they can proceed uh, to create more trust in, this, in the system. So they IPO'd in Tokyo in 2018. And they were one of Japan's uh, first unicorns. So it's important to note the culture in Japan is different than in the U.S. Uh, for example, in the U.S., we tend to buy our weekly groceries at large supermarkets and store them in a large refrigerator. In Japan, it's much more common to stop by the corner store called a konbini uh, on the way home for your day, like sort of day or next day's needs. Uh, kiosks, vending machines, touch points are a part of daily life. And uh, plugging into these are critical for any consumer-focused business in the country. So in the home market in Japan, Mercari allows users to list items in less than three minutes and then use Mercari shipping to send items nationwide from 79,000 partner kiosks. And they recently uh, introduced a partnership to add 150,000 more locations. So their partners are you know, the largest shipping companies in Japan, as well as convenience stores like Family Mart, 7-Eleven, etc. Users avoid the hassle of shipping labels and they just use a QR code on their phone to deposit their item into a kiosk. Uh, and they have a flat rate uh, fee for shipping regardless of distance in the country. So for me, you know, upon reviewing this company, I think it was more, I think the secret sauce here is that Mercari is really a subtle and non-promotional AI powerhouse with several core features that apply leveraged, um, that leverage applied AI. And so primarily they have an AI listing feature with, which utilizes computer vision and natural language processing to allow users to simply take a photo of any item and have the name, category, brand, et cetera, automatically filled in. About 60% of listings use this feature today and they say that listing completion rate um, and listings per person have increased all due to this AI listing feature. Secondly, they support image search, which uh, allows a user to select a photo of an item from the internet or their camera, search for it among Mercari listings. So imagine you know, going to the store, seeing a jacket or something that you like and seeing if it's on sale for Mercari for less than it is at the store, uh, which is taking a photo of it. 
they claim users list and purchase more items uh, than competitors and that makes Macari a more enjoyable sort of buying like a treasure hunt. Uh, they use that transaction data to feed recommender systems, which is also AI, to uh, match a user's taste to items that they might be interested in in their feed. So it's kind of influenced by this like system and uh, kind of reminds me of like, you know, TikTok or meets eBay. It's like Poshmark where they, you know, they claim users in Japan uh, spend as much time on Mercari as they actually do on social media sites. Uh, so in 2020, they also launched an at your service shipping, which is like equivalent to Amazon fulfillment um, in order to simplify the shipping process for those who find that effort to be a hurdle. Um, you know, users can just lift off their item to uh, Mercari at a kiosk, no packaging, no shipping, no labels. Uh, they just use their phone. Um, in the U.S., uh, third-party businesses exist like this for eBay, um, but Mercari is sort of taking this all in-house. Uh, so I ass estimate this would be a small percentage of sales, but it might help. Um, Mercari does skew young and female. Um, it aligns with their sort of marketplace category distribution, which has a heavy tilt towards women's apparel. Uh, they have 18 million MAUs in Japan, which means that one in seven Japanese people use Mercari every month. Uh, they claim that there's another 36 million who they can target um, and they want to list, but they haven't taken their first step yet. So their primary growth driver here in Japan is to kind of capture those 36 million people who want to list but haven't done it so. So they're going to keep uh, expanding their AI listing features. Um, they're trying to make it a huge percentage of the total. Uh, they have barcode listing, uh, easy listing integration. This is kind of interesting to me. Anything that you purchase through their Merpay online payment system uh, which I can talk about that later, is uh, digitally deposited into your app's sort of inventory. So you can select items from your inventory and resell them on Macari. So in the vision, the long run here, everyone will have a digital inventory of all of the items in their home, which they can quickly select and resell at any time. So that would improve you know, platform retention and reselling rates, obviously, which Macari takes a cut of this. I think this is a great idea. Um, so they also want to do this data integration with manufacturers uh, since we're on short on time here, I'll just give a basic idea. They want to use their transaction data and sell it to manufacturers. And so with a, with a mature market, they can sense trends. So what are people searching for? What are people buying? What's the best click-through rate? They can sell that data to, like for example, clothing manufacturers and uh, monetize their uh, data, just not just on the take rate, but also on that data fee. They also partner with an ungodly number of... <laughs> Institutions in Japan, I don't have time to go through all of this, but you can see it on that write-up. Um, I think the most exciting development here for Mercari is, is Merpay. So it's very you know, hot industry in fintech. Um, Merpay is a mobile payment service. So users can make payments on Mercari and at 1.8 million stores in Japan. So they can spend money that they've earned by selling items on Mercari, avoiding bank accounts. So keep it all in house. Uh, as of the recent report, Merpay has over 8 million users. They allow payment at stores with QR codes like Apple Pay, uh, similar to Apple Pay. Uh, users can take advantage of credit features like buy now, pay later. They can defer all future payments to a lump sum. Um, and the management has specifically said that Merpay is raising their earnings potential because of the credit business, which is very lucrative. They charge a 15% APR on these services. All right. Um, so typically, Japan has had a cash-based society. So the government is trying to move people off of cash. They have this sort of no-cash vision. And so there's a lot of different mobile payment startups that are trying to kind of take space right now, and um, Mercari is one of them. So they also acquired another fintech company to kind of expand in this industry. Um, so they have a partnership with actually with C Limited, funny enough. Uh, it allows cross-border sales to Taiwan through Shopee, um, and there's some more information in there. So there's a huge U.S. Uh, expansion here going on. Obviously, you've probably seen TVs ahead of an uh, ad that played around the Super Bowl, and um, many of us have used it. As part of my due diligence, I uh, bought and sold item on Mercari. Uh, it's probably too much to go into here, but um, you can kind of view on the App Store. They have re great reviews, and uh, it's a little different than all the other marketplaces in certain ways. So it's all online. It's all shipped. Um, it's anonymous. Uh, it's used. So it's it's got a lot of different little quirks to it that kind of create its own little niche here. And they have deals with FedEx and uh, UPS for quick shipping. 
They have authentication like Poshmark does as well uh, for luxury items, but they're not really necessarily focused on luxury items. They're kind of a cross item platform and they're not even necessarily just focused on fashion. All right. They got a whole bunch of other bets as well. You know, one thing you'll notice with Japanese companies is that they have sort of this parent child relationship where they have a holding company and then they have all these little subsidiaries. Uh, and then Macari is no different than that. All right. So, yeah, they want to build out this whole、um, data infrastructure with manufacturers. And in the long run, you know, that might be a considerable amount of their business.、Uh, it's very important to know the Macari US is led by John Lagerling, who worked at Google.、Uh, he was the head of、uh, global Android. Uh, partnerships and moved to Facebook as VP development for mobile.、Uh, he has a lot of experience in mobile and mobile ads, and、uh, he also worked at uh, NK uh, Docomo, which is a huge Mercari partner in Japan. And、uh, I think that's really important, kind of getting somebody who's mobile first.、Uh, basically, I think, because I'm kind of out of time here, I want to leave the deep dive on the financials if you guys want to review that.、Uh, basically, this is a pretty cheap company. I think it trades at like seven. Time sales,、uh, last 12 month sales,、uh, and it's very profitable in Japan. You know, there are risks、uh, because Japanese companies don't get the valuations that American companies do.、Uh, and so you have to kind of take apart each part of this business and, and value it separately. So, you know, what is that US business worth? You know, what is this Japanese business with a 30 to 40 percent operating income margin worth? And then kind of try and piece those together. and And see what the full value of the company is. You know, they don't have a current plan to list in the US. And so, you know, that is definitely a huge risk here because, you know, I don't think that they're ever going to get that US valuation if they don't. And so, you know, it could just languish here for a long time. That's why I say, you know, I don't know if I really kind of recommend the company, but it's something that might be interesting. Yeah, and there's a bunch of other stuff. Obviously, there's a lot of competition in the US.、Uh, there's this whole, you know, one other risk is this sort of Japanese corporate ethos where they really don't like you to sacrifice profitability for growth. And that's completely opposite of what people do in the US. And so, you know, whether, they may never get that kind of US multiple if they're not willing to kind of go full in. And if their investors say, okay, no more. If the US business is not profitable quickly, you know, it's potentially possible that they could shut it down. Which would make the business a lot less attractive to me because the US business recently have been growing over 100%. So, a bunch of different kind of risks here. I think if you're interested, look at my deep dive. I kind of explain everything and、uh, kind of go from there. Great job, man. 10 minutes is really fast. <laughs> you did really good. Thank you so much. I appreciated that one.、Um, uh, up next, we have, I think it's Satoshi, the alien guy. Um, with、uh, J- Jumia, right? Am I wrong? I think it's Jumia.、Yep. Yes, we're going to talk about Jumia.、Uh, thanks <laughs> for having、guy. me, guys.、Um, so, Jumia, I think you guys are all familiar with, right? To some extent, at least.、Uh, it's been called the Amazon of Africa, which I think, although it's like a great idea, it's probably a really bad、um, slogan for them because they have a lot more to develop in terms of becoming the actual Amazon of Africa. But I really do like the three prong process here with Jumia. So it's a company that has a logistics arm, a marketplace, and a, almost a fintech offering, right, with Jumia Pay.、Um, so, why is Jumia so、um, attractive to people? Well, there's 1.2 billion people in Africa with a median age of 19.4 years.、Uh, and that's an incredible amount of people, so future customers, obviously. And it's the age that's really attractive, right?、Um, Our parents and grandparents aren't the ones that will be buying things online in the future. And the fact that Africa is such a young continent、uh, really makes this process really attractive, right? There's 450 million internet users, and they're basically all using cell phones. So, one of the things that was so great about C Limited was that in Asia or East Asia, Southeast Asia, they kind of went from no internet to cell phones, right? People kind of bypassed computers, and that's a process that really cuts down on. Um, a lot of things, right? So for Jumia, I think this is something that can make、uh, people kind of get closer to the product quicker, right? Currently, they're present in 11 countries, right? Which reaches about 600 million people plus.、Um, and those countries that Jumia is present in are responsible for like 70% of Africa's GDP and nearly 70% of Africa's internet users, right? 
So they're concentrated in the parts of Africa where the most amount of people with the most amount of cell phones and internet access are available. And that's a huge uh, total addressable market in the making, right? Um, one of the things that makes Africa a really tough continent to kind of work with in terms of e-commerce is logistics, right? And Jumia kind of stepped in there and started to build that infrastructure that was needed to solve that logistics problem, right? So you may have heard that China's kind of been building roads and kind of colonizing and doing things like that, essentially, uh, in Africa, which is crazy, and it's not a wild idea, but basically Jumia is kind of benefiting from some of the hard infrastructure that's being created, and they're kind of coming in here to make it where e-commerce could be a thing, right? Um, believe it or not, people didn't really have like addresses and mailboxes, and it's something that's really new, which is crazy to think about what we are used to here in America or other um, more developed and countries, right? Uh, but the thing I like about their logistics um, business is that they provide home delivery, they offer pickup locations, and they actually started offering last mile delivery for like banks and other retailers. So if you like order like a debit card, um, Jumia will like bring it to your house from the bank. And that's pretty cool and pretty helpful, right? Um, they're also starting the process of expanding their logistics platform to third parties. Um, so that kind of gives them more leeway to work with, right? Just think about like if Amazon would start offering their vans and you know their technology and their warehouses to other stores, right? That's kind of what we were looking at here. You have 1,300 seller drop-off and pickup locations, 23 warehouses in 11 countries. Um, you're starting to see some real development here that's really helpful, right? 55% um, of packages are reaching customers in less than 24 hours. That's growth um, that kind of improved from 44% in 2019. Um, and that's for the month of Black Friday. So in Africa, they don't do Black Friday as like a one day hellstorm of shopping. It's kind of like a month long experience, right? And uh, in 2020, Jimmy has shipped almost half a million packages on the behalf of more than 270 clients. Not a ton in terms of like, you know, when you think about what we're doing in America, but for a region that's not necessarily fully um, pushed forward with e-commerce, this is a great opportunity, right? And the one cool thing about it is that their fulfillment expenses have been dropping and they drop per order by 16%, um, which kind of brings us to what makes Jumia such a complicated um, company, right? And it's the fact that their numbers for the past year and quarter look really terrible on paper. Like this, if you look at just strictly numbers, you're probably sitting there saying like, why the hell is anyone even owning this stock? Why is it not worth five bucks, right? Um, but and there's a reason for basically their growth to have decelerated and slowed so enormously, right? And it's because Jumia intentionally went from basically trying to grow by selling really high price electronics and phones and things like that. Um, they went and pivoted in a different way, right? So they stopped selling electronics, they stopped selling phones, and they stopped really focusing on first party sales. And their main goal and purpose was to focus on shrinking losses and inching closer to profitability, right? So now they're looking at more higher margin items, basically household goods, everyday items, so the kind of things that you would order more than once in your lifetime, right? Like if I buy a fridge, yeah, that fridge might cost me two grand, um, but that fridge is going to be bought once over the course of like 15 years, hopefully, right? Uh, now we're focusing more on what people are going to buy every day, right? And that's more attractive, I think. And it's been part of their goal to shrink their losses and get closer to becoming a profitable co uh, company, which is starting to work, right? Um, they're focusing now on being asset light. They kind of want third parties to start offering products to consumers. And the whole idea is be the platform, but not the retailer that's giving you everything you need. Let other people you know, provide the products and we'll just handle everything else. Um, and that's kind of been reflected so far in their gross merchandise line. Uh, line. Right, so digital services grew 41% year over year, food delivery grew 32%, cancellations dropped. Um, the one thing I think is really awesome to talk about that no one talks about is the fact that marketplace advertising is um, growing 30% Q4 and 27% year over year. So this is something that no one talks about. Um, it's one of the reasons why Amazon has become such a monster um, because Advertising is everything, right? Like that's why people own Roku and Pinterest we, and Facebook and Google. Like advertising runs the world. And with Africa, it's not like here where um, you have the ability to advertise as um, abundantly, right? Um, 
they have open air markets, right? So people are still basically shopping in person um, amongst these, themselves, right? When you go in Jumia, it gives the companies and brands an opportunity to now advertise their product and increase brand awareness in a rapidly growing market that um, could help Jumia actually increase their sales and increase their profitability quicker than people would normally think, right? And all of these increases in GMV basically are kind of reflected in their adjusted EBITDA losses shrinking per order by 46%, um, which is a great for a great thing for a company that was blowing through cash and on the verge of looking like they were going to go bankrupt, right? Gross profits have now increased by 15%. It's not a stellar product to look at, but it's an attractive um, opportunity where we see growth going from nothing to now something right and this is the thing about like the emerging worlds is that like we see we see right they have a great platform for e-commerce but they also have a great platform for a mobile wallet right a digital wallet mobile payments uh and jumia pay is essentially their answer to a lot of these issues that are present currently in africa right so they're focusing on working with developers in egypt to increase um, digital wallets and assets, or, and assist rather, sorry, the un or underbanked population that's present, right? So a lot of developers in Africa are kind of concentrated in Egypt and Jumia has been like moving their Jumia pay, um, basically um, where, like offices to Egypt because that's like where all the best I, I thinkers are. And they're really focused on increasing their offerings for their wallet, right? Um, and their TPV rose 30% year over year in Q4. Penetration rose by 65%. And it's something that like, it's not gonna become Venmo, it's not gonna become Cash App, it's not gonna, it probably won't even be as big as C money, but it's something that gives them an extra leg and an extra opportunity. And more importantly than anything, it gives the people in Africa a chance to now move their money online and kind of give their money more purpose than just strictly uh, paying for goods in an open air market, right? As you know, like um, Jack Dorsey has been making some efforts into Africa with uh, Cash App and Bitcoin. Um, Akon had that idea of like a cryptocurrency, like super haven in Africa. Um, they're a very young society that's like very digital focused and uh, a digital wallet is definitely something that would be very helpful, right? Being able to bring people to the forefront of that is really important. It's a $4.2 trillion total addressable market according to ARC, digital wallets. Now, like I said, Jimmy is not going to dominate that. It's not going to take 1% of that. And maybe it will, I don't know, but I'm not expecting them to be the monster. But I look at Jumia pay and I look at like Shopify pay. And if there's a possibility that we can see a similar parallel where there's just some opportunity and some growth um, that can make it a very attractive wing of their business, right? And it's something that's kind of needed to increase cash flow, and it's an asset light way of making them a company that's growing sales quicker and stronger, right? Um, it's growing sales quicker and stronger, right? Um, if you look at estimates, you're going to see some crazy numbers, right? And here's the thing. They're expected to grow 51% um, next year. Own a two and a half billion dollar company that's going to have monster revenue growth like that, right? Um, but when you, you know, kind of dedicate yourself to kind of decelerating sales growth, um, when you decide to flip the switch back on, it's going to look a little inflated. And that's what we have here. So although the numbers are great, this actually can function, I think, as a headwind and a risk potentially because now these are the estimates that are expected of them. And if they haven't figured out their ability to increase sales as they kind of work at shrinking losses, um, that can really affect the stock negatively, right? So that's one thing to consider. Uh, if they're able to beat these numbers, you're going to see the stock explode because it's a thin float. It's heavily shorted at times. Um, it's a FinTwit favorite, like retail loves that I idea and that gimmick of the Amazon of whatever, right? I know personally, like that brought me to see uh, originally because I was like, oh, the Amazon of Southeast Asia, that's pretty cool. Um, but it's not the best way to always approach something. Now, 
I think when you talk about risks, I think the reality is everyone should be afraid that Amazon, Shopee, or Alibaba, or any of these other behemoths can walk into Africa and say, okay, we're going to set up shop. This is going to be our country or our continent, right? Um, and although that's a possibility, I do think the fact that Jumia has been there presently building a logistics network, I think that can kind of create a moat for them and it can kind of give them some margin of safety, right? There were rumors a few months ago that Amazon was interested in buying Jumia. It popped the stock a few bucks and then nothing happened, right? I think Jumia is actually 50% or 100% lower since that moment. I think it was around 60 bucks and that's like 32 bucks. So, um, could Amazon step in? It's always a possibility, but I would not be buying the stock because I think Amazon's going to buy them, right? Like that's a crazy idea. Um, I currently do have a position in Jimmy. It's like a 2% position. I have some bids outstanding, but the reality is um, if you look at the chart, it's not attractive. It's kind of still in that downward descent, hasn't really built the base yet. It's kind of still on the left side. Um, and there is a possibility that it will see some short-term pain still, right? So I think you have to take that into consideration. Um, this is not a company you go and you YOLO like 30 or 40% of your account in. That's like just crazy talk. Um, it's a speculative moonshot bet at the end of the day, right? Two and a half billion dollar market cap. It's technically trading, I think, like seven times next year sales. Um, it's an attractive opportunity for a turnaround story, and it's an attractive opportunity for a potential moonshot growth story, right? Numbers are good. It can very well like hit a $10 billion market cap, and you have a great trade on your hands or better, right? So that's why I own it. Um, but I think you do have to realize that there are risks. Um, they raised cash recently, which is very helpful. It kind of limits some of their um, bankruptcy fears. But you always have to kind of think about what if with Jumia. It's not a company that has like this, you know, brilliant founder that's still running it, right? Like Toby Lickie isn't running it, right? Like Jeff Bezos isn't still running it. Um, this is a company that kind of had a really rough upbringing and there's been a lot of turnover in management and a lot of turnover in um, their process. But I do believe that they're kind of finally starting to figure out what they are and who they are. And I really love what they're building so far, right? Um, I know you'll see the pictures on Twitter of like some guy on a bicycle with like a little wagging behind him that says Jumia on it. Yeah, it's not perfect. But like when you start with nothing, you kind of have to go somewhere. Right. And I do think this is a company that could grow uh, into being basically a real winner in Africa, um, specifically in like Nigeria. And I really like what they have potentially with advertising. They have real partners. Um, I think they have like Nestle and like Exxon. Like there's real people um, that are basically going on their website to advertise their products. And that's a secret weapon of theirs, I think, will be beneficial in the long run. Um, so, yeah, that's Jumia. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Great job, man. And up next, uh, perfect transition, we have Ryan talking about Farfetch. I know a lot of people like Farfetch as well. I think it's a little under-owned on Twitter, but without further ado, Ryan with Farfetch. All right. So uh, first thing to know about me is I'm a marketer, not an analyst or a financial guy. So today I'm going to talk more about why I fell in love with Farfetch um, for a variety of brand reasons and, and uh, some other reasons. So you might be disappointed. You might be interested, uh, but I absolutely love this company. So I found out about Farfetch and uh, immediately uh, had my wife uh, sit down in front of her computer and go through the website. And uh, my wife is definitely into fashion. And um, one thing I've learned from uh, running an agency or marketing is marketing has a lot to do with brand and, and uh, the ability to do marketing effectively is very important. It's a sign of a well-run organization. And I cannot explain the moments of delight that occurred while she was browsing that site. It was, it was incredible. Um, Farfetch has an incredible brand. They execute perfectly. And that was the beginning of uh, me falling in love uh, with this brand. So what I did next was um, I listened to a um, earnings call and I listened to Jose Neves and uh, I start with management first and what a CEO, um, what a vision for the future, what an understanding of fashion, but also technology we will go more into that. But what I was really impressed with was their marketing lead. 
and the extensive amount of knowledge they had and brought up on the conference call with re, uh, respect to detailed demand generation systems that they've implemented and how they use those to extract revenue and margin from their customers. It was actually one of the most extensive uh, explanations of their marketing strategy I've heard on a call in a very long time and immediately fell in love at that point. And I'll get more into Farfetch and why I love it. And I'm not going to really talk about financials as much today. I'm going to talk about more of the softer stuff that maybe you can't find online. You can go find financials online. You can find other stuff. Let's talk about the fashion industry and why I love this platform. First and foremost, getting into the story of Jose is really important. Uh, he was born in Portugal, um, in one of the fashion forward uh, cities in Portugal, and was a coder at a young age. And so when I think about companies and I think about their embedded DNA, I think about a guy that was a coder that was into fashion, that found a CTO and launched a fashion forward technology company. That's not easy to find. If you know anything about the fashion industry, it is one of the least technologically savvy industries on the planet. If anything, they actually thumb their nose at, at, at technology. So to find that combination is incredible and it's embedded within their DNA. Um, he's a very powerful speaker and a very strong uh, vision that frankly, um, he was uh, you know, chastised for, for even bringing this forward. And so that got me so excited. Uh, the, 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 it reminded me of Shopify, reminded me what, how Toby talked. Uh, we bought that early uh, on in its cycle. It reminded me of Peloton and the brand, the power of the brand. And it was really something that, that drove, me, uh, drove me forward in terms of understanding this company. Now, when I think about this company, I think about it in a few ways. Obviously, we think about the marketplace side of this business. And one of the things to understand about the marketplace and what I would encourage you to do is go out to the website. Go see the marketplace experience from a consumer perspective. It is incredible. Um, you can not only find um, specific, obviously, brands, but you can actually shop according to different types of shops around the world and get a customized experience as if you were in Italy, as if you were in, uh, in Paris. And that, to me, is important. The name Farfetch represents the ability to access fashion from anywhere in the world where we had to get on a plane and do that in the past and actually go to a physical location, people around the world can now literally shop as if they were in um, a Versace store um, in, in Italy. And that's very important. That, that, that connects the world and it connects fashion and connects taste. So that's a very important part of the business. And you can actually experience that in a very uh, effective way. And that business is killing it right now. They're doing very well. That business on its own saved businesses. Uh, safe fashion uh, boutiques in COVID. Um, and one of the things you're going to notice about Jose and, and how everything's turned around is he's being hailed as a hero now for really saving some of the fashion industries that were devastated and that had to go uh, online only, especially in Europe where everything was shut down. So I think that's very important. The second part of the business is obviously the store of the future. So we talked about retail. We talked the importance of actual brick and mortar. Well, Farfetch is really bringing technology to the brick and mortar stores and really enabling um, some of these kind of backward thinking uh, fashion brands to actually enable technology within stores. So brick and mortar is not going to go away, but I also encourage you to look at the store of the future where you scan, you come in, your internet history, your shopping history is all there. You can see runway uh, fashion, you can access whatever you want in that store, but it's a much more enhanced experience. And the future to me of retail is actually that type of experience. It's not just about e-commerce. It's not just about brick and mortar. It's about blending those two together to build a more immersive connected experience. But the thing that people aren't talking about, and this is on Twitter, what they're missing is New Guard's brand. And this is called their brand platform. Now, when you understand fashion, one thing you understand about it, if you get it, is that there's, it's very intensive, very capital intensive, and it's long timelines to get an idea from the runway or even conception into stores. New Guards Group was built on the premise of fast fashion. So the whole idea with the brand is they purchased this brand that basically takes, I mean, these guys are using WhatsApp and Facebook Messenger to actually uh, source intelligence on what people are wearing on the street, turn it into fashion, flow it back onto Farfetch, gather data and build an entire funnel of data-driven fast fashion in the fashion industry. And this to me is the future 
of fashion. So they're actually an enabling a new type of fashion brand platform. And to me, that's a big story that no one's talking about. Uh, they can get things onto market right away quickly. And basically, instead of following brands, you're going to follow trends and people and cultures and emotions. And they're going to be able to take that and bring it onto a platform uh, very quickly. So to me, that's, that's really what people don't understand. I mean, I've, I've heard people on Twitter talk about what's the difference between Etsy or Amazon and Farfetch. And I'm like, are you kidding me? I mean, the fashion industry is so much different. And there's so many idiosyncrasies like a Bezos, an Etsy, even a Shopify. I mean, this is a, this is a completely different industry. And, and to me, Farfetch is perfectly uh, positioned as a platform to enable uh, the fashion industry. And that's the part that everyone is missing. So we look at it as a platform. It is a, is a platform. We look at it as a marketplace. We look at it as a store of the future. We look at it as even uh, a platform for retailers. Harrods is, is using Farfetch um, uh, it, it, to, to actually act as a retail. We look at all of that stuff. And I think that's really all important. But really what Farfetch is about is enabling the entire fashion industry to use technology. And, and a vision really to connect fashion around the world. Now, on top of that, they are exceptional at marketing and branding. And to me, that, that is a part that, especially when you go onto FinTwit or Twitter, I mean, the marketing side of these things, you gotta understand this in terms of a culture or disposition. They are way ahead in terms of trends. Um, they were one of the first um, online brands to champion black led fashion. Um, ESG is a huge part of them. They are completely on top of the brands and they know what they're doing there. Now, last but not least, I don't think anyone's touching them in China. I think they've made a move into China that's going to be incredibly difficult to beat. Obviously, they're partnered with Alibaba. They did Tmall. Um, they've, they're, part of this is they're basically owned partially by uh, Chinese companies and they're making moves and they're getting aggressive. And if you very simply go to uh, Farfetch, and you go to the Chinese or uh, localized version, you can see that, as you can tell, over the last few uh, months has been this anti-Western sentiment. Well, these brands are localized to the Chinese market. They're, they're, they're the bridge for the Western brand to speak to the Chinese market in the way that they want to be spoken to. And I think people are absolutely missing um, this whole part of it. So this, to me, is a, just a beautiful company. I don't usually find companies like this. And when I do, I can tell. I get excited. I get emotional. Uh, reminds me early days of Shopify. Reminds me of Peloton a little bit. I love Peloton and the brand they stand for. But um, like Anthony was mentioning, they have so many legs right now that they can, that they can leverage. And there's going to be more. Um, look into e-concession and what they're doing in e-concession. New Guards Group, to me, by the way, it's a $2 billion company. Easily. It's a $2 billion company. It's a platform in which they can acquire other brands and literally have their own marketplace to quickly launch these into market. Um, and so it, it's just an exceptional company all around. I'm very excited about it. When Bill Wong dumped that stock because he went crazy on margin, I couldn't buy enough. <laughs> I could not buy enough. Bill Wong, I'm glad I have your shares because you missed out big time uh, on all this stuff. And so um, to me, it's just a perfectly uh, manifested company from uh, brand to execution to leverage points. They're turning around in terms of profitability. Uh, I love this company. I hope you guys fall in love as well, too. Great job, Ryan. Really could hear the passion in your voice for that company. And you make me want to go back in and look into it. So thanks a lot for your time. I appreciate it. Super good job, man. No worries. Um, we got two speakers left, if I'm not mistaken. I think we have mostly borrowed ideas. Speaking about Shopify, definitely a FinTwin favorite. So whenever you're ready, man. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for inviting me. This is uh, pretty much the first time I'm speaking on Twitter space. Uh, so uh, I, I basically publish one deep dive every month on my website, MBI Deep Dives. And I wrote a deep dive on Shopify this month, uh, which is what I'm going to briefly discuss. Uh, so Shopify has been an incredible success story and almost everyone is probably in love with the stock uh, at this point. Uh, and I was just checking before publishing my deep dive and was literally stunned to find out Shopify became almost 75X in the last five years. Uh, ironically, they had a hard time raising venture money uh, in the early days of Shopify. 
so let me briefly explain how Shopify generates its revenue. I know it, pretty much everyone probably knows this, but I'll just you know breeze through it. So Shopify generates uh, reports its revenue in two segments: uh, subscription solutions and margin solutions. Uh, so let's talk about one by one. Uh, Shopify has three subscription plans for SMBs to build an online store. Uh, so basically, anyone with a credit card can build an online store through Shopify platform. Uh, so these three plans are basic Shopify, Shopify, and advanced Shopify. Uh, basic plans basically cost $29, standard cost $79, and advanced cost $299 per month. Uh, so while Shopify initially targeted SMB merchants uh, in e-commerce, today it has it has a number of enterprise clients uh, from the likes of successful DTC brands such as Allbirds, uh, to legacy brick and mortar retailers uh, who want to have e-commerce operations such as staples. Uh, and for these enterprise clients, Shopify Plus was launched, which costs $2,000 per month or 0.25% of GMV, whichever is higher, uh, with the maximum price being $40,000 per month. Uh, so that's subscription solution. Uh, margin solution, uh, which basically uh, Shopify generated 70% 70, 70 of its total revenue from, from this segment in 2020. And super majority of uh, this margin solution basically comes from Shopify payments. Uh, Shopify has payment service provider agreements with Stripe. And apart from Shopify payments, margin solutions also consist of referral fees from partners, advertising revenue on the App Store, Shopify App Store, uh, Shopify Capital, Shop Pay installments, uh, Shopify Shipping, and recently launched uh, Shopify Fulfillment Network. So there's a lot of like a bunch of things that are included within the margin solutions. Uh, so in broad brush, that's how Shopify generates revenue from uh, subscription and margin solutions. Uh, and like I said, everyone loves Shopify, uh, but at current price, uh, current prices, I am at best lukewarm. Uh, about generating decent return over the long term. Uh, so I'll primarily focus on things that give me pause, but I, I want to mention that it's it's intentional. It doesn't mean Shopify doesn't have a lucrative set of opportunities ahead of them from business perspective. I'm just intentionally highlighting aspects that may make it difficult ride for you know current shareholders. Like you know, if you're buying at today's price, uh, it, like why that would give me a pause. So I just intentionally uh, would like to discuss that uh, in that space, but obviously uh, I'm intentionally leaving out a lot of the positives uh, you know, of Shopify. Uh, so broadly speaking, there are three things that give me pause. Uh, first would be valuation. Uh, the second would be the dynamic between DTC and marketplaces in e-commerce. And finally, uh, the competition for ancillary services such as Shopify uh, fulfillment network may face, uh, you know, uh, going forward. So I'll try to sketch a back of the envelope valuation first, and then expand that discussion on other two points. Uh, so Shopify generated roughly 120 billion dollar GMV in 2020, and its take rate was 2.9 percent which I'm defining as just revenue divided by GMV. If Shopify's GMV grows at 24% uh, in a CAGR basis for the next 10 years, uh, and it grows to $1 trillion of GMV, and let's say if its take rate increased from 2.4% in 2020 to three times, uh, so 7.3% in 2030, it leads to uh, $73 billion of revenue uh, in 2030. So Shopify's revenue today is $2.9 billion. So almost 25 times revenue of today's level in 10 years. And if their EBIT margin is 22%, and if it trades at 20 times EV to EBIT multiple, Shopify will have uh, roughly $325 billion market cap in 2030. And if we assume one percent dilution uh, because of you know, stock-based compensation or new share issuance, we are roughly looking at six percent CAGR uh, return from today's prices. 
so basically, Shopify can hit it out of the park, and today's shareholders may still not enjoy outsized return, uh, you know, despite incredible execution by Shopify. So that's something. Those are, so the numbers I kind of mentioned in you know, when I uh, like discuss this back of the envelope valuation. Uh, those numbers kind of give me pause. Uh, uh, so that's probably the first uh, pause that I receive. Uh, it's it's so I, I want to discuss valuation first, but obviously it's usually the conclusion. And uh, like you know, that was also part of the structure. Like when I wrote the deep dive, the valuation came last. But you know, because of the time constraint, I wanted to discuss this first, and then kind of expand, uh, on, on, like you know, uh, uh, from the valuation uh, point. So now let's talk about the roadblocks to reach those GMV level and how likely it is that Shopify can triple its take rates uh, in 10 years. So if you talk about long-term future, there are two things that may be a huge driver for Shopify. Uh, one is e-commerce penetration in the long term, and the other is the dynamic between DTC and marketplaces. So in 2020, e-commerce penetration was 20% in the US. And the consensus estimates at this point that it will reach roughly 40% in 2030. Uh, but before the pandemic, the consensus was around like 28 to 30%. And I don't know whether it's just me, but part of me sometimes wonder whether we should be a bit underhelmed with just 20% e-commerce penetration in 2020. Uh, basically, we are all literally forced to buy things online by mother nature and yet, 80% of the sales did not happen online. So I wonder whether pandemic has biased the S estimates uh, a little too much uh, on, on the upward side. But obviously Shopify is not just US or North American story. It's increasingly becoming a global story. Uh, international revenue was 20% of total revenue in 2016, and it increased to 27% in 2020. Uh, However, China is a huge part of the global e-commerce story, but Shopify has hardly any presence there. Uh, Baojun, a NASDAQ listed company with ticker BZUN, is known as the Shopify of China. Uh, and uh, it's funny because it has half the top line of Shopify, but it has like 2.5% of market cap of Shopify, right? Uh, so. Despite the massive e-commerce market of China, it is largely dominated by marketplaces and not e-commerce platform. Now, Shopify's margins or you know uh, or SMB like and margins, uh, they're they're primarily DTC like direct to customer, but their margins can also use marketplaces as one of their channels to sell online. Uh, but that's typically not why you would want to be a Shopify merchant. You want the customers to buy directly from your website. And one investor I spoke with about Shopify mentioned he's less concerned about GMV, but more concerned about take rates, uh, especially in a potential situation if marketplaces trump the DTC channel. Uh, GMVs can be double counted if you use Shopify platform but sell things in a marketplace. So while both marketplace and Shopify can count it as GMV, Shopify's take rates can potentially be a lot lower if the merchant sells on marketplace instead of his, his or her own website. So therefore, while success of marketplaces is not existential question for Shopify, uh, they would much prefer, Shopify would much prefer that their merchants be able to sell directly on their Shopify store. So the other question is, uh, can the DTC revolution powered by Shopify gain even more momentum in the next uh, 10 to 15 years. In, in, in many ways, uh, the last decade or so was an anomaly in the CPG space. Uh, for context, from 1923 to 1983, the top brands in more than 10 categories were essentially unchanged. So large CPG companies enjoyed the largest competitive advantage duration compared to probably any sector out there. And despite all the success of DTC brands in the last decade or so, I do wonder whether that the best days of DTC are sort of behind us. Uh, the DTC startups rise was 
enabled by an environment of abundant venture capital, low competition, and above all, advertising arbitrage that could be exploited on underpriced social media platforms. In fact, an analysis done on 60,000 Shopify stores clearly demonstrated that a whopping 75% of total revenue for those Shopify stores comes from the direct traffic. Basically, when visitors come right away to your store by typing its URL into the, their browsers or through browse, you know, browser bookmarks. So the bar is clearly high for Shopify margins to be successful. And I have no doubt that some will defy the odds and reach greater heights with more compelling economics than they might be able to enjoy building in marketplaces. Uh, but to what extent it can be scalable uh, will remain a very, very hard question for me uh, to answer. I'll discuss a bit more about Shopify Fulfillment Network and conclude my uh, discussion. So the first question that comes to my mind is whether Shopify will, will focus on partnering with third-party logistics companies or building an Amazon-like you know, fulfillment network itself. The base case is they will focus on partnership in the initial years, uh, but they will ramp up uh, building their own fulfillment network in future. If it's just partnership with 3PL companies, uh, its its direct competitors can also do probably similar deals and the same 3PL companies, uh, and therefore basically it may not be a strong differentiator. But no other direct competitor of Shopify has even a remote possibility of thinking about building their own fulfillment network with warehouses and delivery logistics. So my guess is Shopify will ramp up its end-to-end -end nat native fulfillment network, which will increase its modes, but it might be very difficult business and success is far from guaranteed as Amazon can itself introduce a sort of white label logistic solution if they think that Shopify is a very legitimate threat to them. So although I'm not, not a logistics expert, uh, it does seem to me that the path to get there can prove to be extremely difficult for Shopify. Uh, logistics is extremely capital intensive business and the economics may not be very lucrative, even though it can, like I said, certainly enhance modes for Shopify if they're successful at it. Uh, for example, now just to give you a bit, con bit more context, the cumulative capex of FedEx from 2005 to 2019 was $55 billion. And yet the total enterprise value for the whole company was 60 billion at the end of 2019. And after the pandemic, like, you know, the stock kind of has skyrocketed and now it's enterprise value is $105 billion. So it's a very capital intensive business, you know, it's a, a, a relatively low margin business. Like FedEx's margin was never 10% in last like 15 years. Uh, but obviously it's not apple to apple comparison. Shopify will probably take like a, you know, uh, sort of a balanced approach in terms of partnership and uh, like building their own logistic solution. Uh, uh, so it's, it's more of a nuanced, uh, you know, discussion. It's very hard. It's not a, like black and white. Shopify has no chance or anything like that. Uh, so I want to emphasize one more time that I, I intentionally did not discuss much about Shopify's competitive advantage or, or how they can still possibly win, as I think those are, you know, probably discussed much more on the wider uh, internet. Uh, but it's not impossible by any means that Shopify can still defy the odds and have, you know, another great decade, not for the company itself, but for uh, you know, today's shareholders as well. Uh, but I think, you know, uh, the odds are getting tougher and tougher. Uh, I think the market uh, has been somewhat uh, assuming success in all the areas Shopify is going into. Uh, but my, you know, uh, my, my base case is, is it's probably going to be uh, tougher for Shopify from now on because it's basically the competition is becoming Amazon, the competition is becoming Facebook. And those are much, you know, stiffer competition, com you know, compared to let's say, uh, big commerce, e-commerce. You know, those are the competition Shopify will definitely probably annihilate uh, in the next ten years. Uh, so, so that's that. Those are the things that kind of give me pause, and I'll, I'll stop, stop it here. That was a pretty impressive presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, great. Uh, just like Mark mentioned, uh, Shop is one of the um, darlings on fintweet community 
Thank you for making this presentation very informative. Even though you had only 10 minutes to cover, I think you did a great job. And uh, Mark would like to introduce you, Jin. Sure, sure. So for our final speaker, um, we have Eugene uh, going to be talking about a newer company that just IPO'd, what, a month or two ago? I think we're going to be talking about Coupang. So whenever you're ready, go ahead. Thanks a lot, Mark. Good morning, everyone from Asia. Hanyeonghaseyo from the land of South Korea. Coupang or CPNG is a South Korean specific e-commerce company. I would like to say Ting, Amazon, Instacart, and DoorDash in, of South Korea all in one. Coupang was actually founded in 2010 by Bom Kim. He was, he was born in Seoul, left South Korea at the age of seven. Age 13, he went to Harvard and then subsequently attended Harvard Business School, but dropped out after six months to start Coupang. If I think about the history of Coupang, it's really just three pivots. He started off as a Groupon-style daily deal type of uh, website, subsequently pivoted into an eBay-style uh, 3P marketplace, and actually post actually re invented himself into an end-to-end -end 1P e-commerce company that it is today. Uh, as Mark mentioned recently, IP on the NASDAQ just slightly over a month ago on March 11, raising 4.6 billion, and the last market cap is around 878 billion. Now, my investment thesis in, in Coupang, which is also a company that I just recently added and is, uh, and is uh, a portfolio holding in, in, in my own fund, which is uh, Vision Capital. Coupang, is, Coupang, the way I think about it, is really the top dog in South Korean e-commerce. It's the top dog and largest e-commerce player in, in South Korea. It's a largely about 19% market share. The closest competitors are, are Naver, which is around 13.6%, and eBay Korea at 12.8%. Now, what really is Coupang? It has three main key offerings, e-commerce 1P, that's expanding into the 3P. So I think about it really is like the JD.com of China or the Amazon in the US. Uh, they have the second one, which is the online food grocery. So I think of it as Rocket Fresh. It's kind of very similar to Instacart or Prime Now. The third one is online food deliveries or what we call Coupang Eats, DoorDash, the Uber Eats of US, the Delivery Rule of UK, Meituan Ping of China or Swiggy of India. Now, the other emerging off offerings, uh, which is like payments, coupon pay, advertising as well. Now, but before I jump into it, I just want to cover very quickly about South Korea. Now, South Korea, because coupon operates only specific in South Korea, uh, it's important. South Korea has a very high internet and mobile penetration market. Uh, it's extremely uh, retail competitive and more importantly on the lifestyle. Everyone works very hard and works very late. If you think about it uh, very simply, South Korea's GDP is 1.6 trillion. One third of that is retail spend, and of that one third retail spend, about one third is e-commerce. Now that is expected to grow about 10% CAGR. Overall, if I look at it from the 10 perspective, uh, across all the markets, e-commerce, grocery, uh, consumer food service, and advertising, they're all, you know, the penetration rates are all between, I would say 13 to 25, 23%. I always think about the overall e-commerce penetration rate, especially for a country like South Korea to be more specific. And I think it grows, you should uh, eventually touch between 60 to, to 80%, especially as compared to some of the other markets. So overall, if I think about it, a large market opportunity, I think the TAM is around 258 billion. Um, that is versus the existing full year 20 revenues of just about 12 billion. And of course, uh, versus the existing market cap of 70, 77 billion. Now, what do I really like about Coupang's business? It has four key competitive advantages, economies of scale, network effects of the e-commerce platform, Specifically, I really love the end-to-end, -end, last mile, fulfillment logistics and uh, network. It's the largest B2C logistics footprint, over 100 fulfillment centers, uh, and it has over 40,000 workers. Coupang is actually the, one of the largest employers uh, in South Korea. Now, all, all in all, I think about it, there's very high barriers to entry, surprisingly. Uh, and also, importantly, 70% 70, 70 of the population actually lives within seven miles of a Coupang uh, logistics center. What I really like is, and that's why Coupon has been rapidly gaining market share, is the superior user experience. The Coupon actually enables next day and even dawn delivery. So just imagine you can order your, 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 your stuff before midnight. You can get it placed next day before 7 a.m. That, that is just crazy. I mean, you're supported by RocketWow, which is a very similar to like Amazon Prime. You might have a monthly uh, fee unlimited shipping. Third that I really like is the care for an environment. It's boxless zero packaging for more than 75% of the parcels. Uh, they use kind of eco bags where people deliver their food groceries in and when they kind of return it. More importantly, there's frictionless returns without the need to even pack a box or even print the label. That, that is just crazy. Now, what do I really like about Coupang's financials? It's rapidly growing. 
uh, last year's re- last year's revenues was growing at twelve billion and ninety percent year on year. Obviously, we have some COVID bump there, but it's actually been uh, been reaccelerating. Now, I expect tougher comes for twenty twenty one, but I think directionally it's there. It's supported by strong and growing business metrics. There's been strong spent growth retention. Cohorts are increasing their spend. Now, but more importantly, people say coupon, you know, it's, it's unprofitable. But if I think about it, if I look at all their all their gross profit margin trends, they're actually moving in the right direction. Uh, there's extreme operating leverage and there's a clear path to profitability. Just to give an example, right? Gross profit margins move from five percent to seventeen percent. EBIT move from minus twenty six to minus four. Net income margins move from minus twenty seven to minus four percent. That's what I really like. I like direction to be correct. Uh, the strong and improving cash flow generation is actually OCF. Uh, positive right now from minus 17% to 3%. Free cash flows margins are also all moving in the right direction from minus 19% to minus 2%. I suspect uh, coupon will actually be coming to be free cash flow, I suspect, in, in, the, in the next year or so. Uh, more importantly, like any e com business, the thing that I really love is the positive cash flows or what we call negative cash conversion cycle. Coupon actually has a negative working capital of about 900 million. And that's really the beauty of any e-commerce business because you're receiving payments up front and you're only really seeing the payments to supplies later on. So it's kind of theoretically, coupon can, can never almost go bankrupt just because of that positive flow. It has a solid balance sheet, about 4.3 billion net cash. And, and that's what I really like. Ultimately, if I think about it from a management standpoint, it's founder-led, owned by Bomb Kim. He's just a very young age of 42 years old, has very high insider ownership of 10%, solid glass door ratings, 3.9 stars, 77% CEO approval ratings. I really like about, the, about Coupon is the optionality to expand to other product vertical expansions, um, big payments. I, I see travel, entertainment, even rental as, as something that's interesting. Advertising, marketing solutions is definitely one. Video streaming, they have actually acquired the Southeast Asia video streaming platform, uh, which is called HOQ back in July of last year. And lastly, actually, geographically, they have actually uh, had, had some China expansion seeing potentially even Singapore, which they recently actually just advertised for ads because Singapore is a very similar, uh, uh, I would say very similar in terms of overall uh, compared to South Korea. And large, largely, I see them expanding uh, to three, to a 3P kind of, of framework, largely from their 1P driven. So think about it very, very, like, very similar to Amazon. Uh, I want to run through competition because something is something that's not fairly known uh, in, South, in South Korea. So competition in South Korea is very hyper-local. There's very few uh, foreign competition, actually. And more importantly, Coupon just managed to gain market share, and it's really driven by two things, fast delivery service and rapid product category expansion. In, in South Korea, the e-commerce space are actually kind of divided into five groups. The first one, you have your incumbent open market platforms, which is eBay's Korea, uh, Korea kind of G-Market. We have also SK Telecom's 11th Street, the second one would be logistics, obviously, and 1P model driven, which is Coupang. That one is really some of this mega platform uh, super app players like the likes of Naval and Takao Commerce. Uh, and the fourth one, we have like your big your big retailer online malls such as SSG, Lotte On. And fifth, individual mall apps such as the Musingsa, ZigZag, and Market Curly. But really, I think if you think about it, Coupon has just managed to gain market share rapidly over the last two to three years. And I think because of their strengths, it plays, it plays right into their advantage. I think about it as eventually the South Korean market being more fragmented to become a winner takes most. I suspect uh, Coupon will probably lead the way along with Naver, uh, Naver along the road. When would I sell if I would see sustained lower, so user growth, user lower growth, user spend matrix, uh, rapidly decelerating revenue growth or, or, or worsening margin profile? One, one day I really like to watch new, graph, new geographical expansion, any vertical expansion in payments, advertising, or other verticals, competition. And I also watch so, the social responsibility and regulatory risk standpoint because it is one of the largest employers in South Korea. All in all, top dog, growing rapidly, gaining market share, I suspect it's winners takes most market, uh, support by the moat of the end-to-end unrivaled logistics footprint, a user experience, Top, top line uh, focus execution, improving financials and operating leverage, profitability, path to profitability is clear, is clear from my standpoint. Very positive cash flow dynamics, founder led owned, high insider ownership. The way I think about it, if coupons revenues can hit three to five times in five to seven years, and with profits and cash flows growing even faster than the top line, in my opinion, I think coupon could return three to seven X over five to seven years. I think it makes coupon owning now in three to five years time and beyond actually look like a no-brainer on hindsight. 
So that's kind of the story um, I want to share in Kumpong. Yeah, Eugene, thank you so much. That was a great presentation. I really appreciate you waking up so early to make it happen. I know it's a 12 hour difference, so it was definitely a challenge, but uh, thank you. That was great, Eugene. Eugene, you. can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Max. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So uh, with this, I think uh, it, it concludes uh, chapter one of financial fitness event. I just wanted to say thank you so much for each of our speakers uh, for doing a phenomenal job covering the company in such a short period of time. It's definitely a challenge to cover a company in 10 minutes. So I appreciate Mark for being a great moderator. I'm really excited about all the future events that should be amazing. We have a great lineup for next week, uh, which will be devoted to fintech industry and all everything related to digital payments. It should be in, uh, I think, it's May 2nd. Now, right? Yes, yes. It will be on May 2nd. And it's going to start on 2 p.m. Eastern time. We're going to try to cover everything in, uh, in about a two-hour window, which is definitely an improvement from our first event, which was about four and a half hours. So that was great. One quick thing I wanted to say uh, is thank you so much, uh, Wolf for all of the graphics and designs thank you so much for everything that you do on the Fintweet community I'm really excited to listen to your presentation next week on Fudo this should be great and if I'm not mistaken uh, uh, he should be probably recording this as well so unless something happened with Twitter spaces you never know what to expect um, and that's pretty much it. And I just invited uh, Gav to give an update on all the notes and all the recordings. Maybe he can talk to us for a little bit about this. Gav, can you hear us? He's yeah, I now. can hear you. Okay. Can Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Cool. This is uh, I'm I'm like on with like three different accounts on this space right now because I'm like taking notes on the Wolf account and I have. A recording going on this account but yeah this is my personal account uh for those that can hear my name is god flagsberg and i run the wolf financial account and i appreciate max just giving us a second uh to chat with y'all so uh myself and josh Meltzer, who's one of the wolf analysts have been taking uh notes throughout this i've been posting them all live on the wolf page so if you go to at wolf underscore financial um you can check out what's been going on there um we're also, I believe, recording. Um, I tried to record this as well as Josh. Unfortunately, some of my recording got a little bit screwed up. Um, I have at least the second half. I think that Josh might have the whole thing. Uh, we're not going to make promises because we got a lot of backlash and angry people on the other recording when we had some technical difficulties. But hopefully this one works out. Um, really just want to appreciate Max for putting this together. Uh, if you like spaces, um, definitely check out. You, know, you can check out my page. Check out the Wolf page. That link's in my bio. We're going to have some fantastic spaces this week. I've got a space tomorrow that's going to be featuring the gaming industry. Um, Chris Seifel is going to be on that. I see him here as well as a few others. Uh, I got a space on Wednesday. I'm going to be doing a one-on-one -on -one with Jonah Lupton. Um, I'm going to be putting out a Google form asking for questions um, that people have for Jonah Lupton. I'm going to be doing like a, basically a one-on-one -on -one interview uh, with him with all those questions. And then on Friday, as always, I'm going to be hosting the weekly Howl at 5 p.m. EST. That is going to be Anthony Ohian is going to be on that from, from Pounding the Table. It's really cool. I'm also going to possibly have uh, one of the general managers for TradingView, um, I believe his name's Pierce. Uh, he's possibly, he's pro hopefully going to be on there. I've been chatting with him as well as Brad Freeman, Stock Market Nerd. We're probably going to keep that to like four people for that panel. So just some fantastic, fantastic panels throughout this week. I'm also planning out personally a financial fitness panel. That's going to be like May 4th. That's a little bit farther off. I'm going to give out more details, but uh, just a, a ton of, a ton of stuff. Um, learned so much here today, obviously, you know, putting in these hours. So you take, I think we have like 10 pages of notes. Um, you can check my page. I think I tweeted like 40 times, 50 times during this uh, from the Wolf account. Again, uh, I don't tweet as much from my personal account, but maybe I should pick that up a little bit because I see I'm getting some fun follows um, as I'm speaking here. But I think that's all I have for now. I don't want to take too much more time. I hope everyone's enjoying their Sunday. I'm going to turn it back to you, Max. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, guys, one more time for everything that you do, for all the graphics. Uh, everyone loves it. Everyone enjoys it. And thanks for all the contributions that you make to the Fintweet community. And I think that, uh, that can conclude it. Uh, we'll see you guys on May 2nd for the Chapter 2 of the Financial Fitness event. Mark, would you like to add anything?
before I end the spaces? No, I think I'm all good. Thanks for showing up, everybody. See you in a couple weeks. Have some good speakers and.